Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the monthly uh, cerebrovascular and skull based symposium of the University of Miami. Always a pleasure to, to be hosting those spectacular speakers that we bring you every month. Uh, this is now, believe it or not, session 40 today on November 18, 2021. And I will introduce those uh, four gentlemen in a, in a couple of minutes. But today is on acoustic neuromas and petroclival meningiomas, two of the most formidable lesions that we can deal with. And you can see where we are along the progression of the 2021 series of lecturers. We are almost to the end of the year, as you well know. Uh, will be joining us again today, our uh, current cerebrovascular and skull base fellow, David Altschuler. Uh, will present a case as well as coming back with, for, with after popular demand our pg3 eva Wu, after she made the presentation last month uh, she will also show us a case uh, i'm jacques morcos professor and co-chair here in the department and uh, director of vascular and and skull base and uh, co uh, the co-directors of the course as always my partner Carolina Benjamin, my partner Mike Ivan, and my partner Bobby Stark. Um, uh, I also encourage you, if you're interested in pediatric, my our pediatric neurosurgical partners uh, do uh, seminars on some Mondays. Uh, uh, keep tu stay tuned for the next one. They're missing one in December, but they resume again in January. And again, so this was, for example, their last one on hydrocephalus and uh, Mike Ivan does the very popular Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium on the first Wednesday of the month and uh, stay tuned for the December one I don't have that flyer but it's the first Wednesday of every month again at 5 p.m. Um, next month uh, for this symposium we will talk about AVMs, aneurysms, flow diversion, and global neurosurgery with a powerhouse uh, uh, lineup with Judy Wang from Johns Hopkins, Ali Sultan, uh, Clement Shermer, Stav Chumakaris. Again, I encourage you to join us for, again, a spectacular session. Many thanks for the team here at the University of Miami that makes these symposia happen month after month. Uh, this is the link if you want to watch all the previous sessions that are all pre-recorded uh, or keep up with the news of our educational efforts. You, we are on Twitter and, and, and email and, and departmental Instagram and so forth. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, as you know, the format of this session is to have four speakers each 20 minutes and then we'll show them a couple of cases and most importantly, you, the audience, throughout the session, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box, and we will address them all at the end. So um, without further ado, and very briefly, this is not the order of the speakers because Jim Liu uh, is uh, held up in the OR, so I've, we switched the order a little bit. And my good friend, Mike Ling, professor of neurosurgery and otolaryngology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, past president of the NASBS, will talk to us today about posterior petrosal approach for petroclival meningioma. Second uh, will be Nick Bembakidis, professor and vice chair at Case Western, again, friend for many, many years. And congrats to him. He is president-elect of the CNS. Third, we'll go Greg Thompson, my friend from fellowship days back in the early 90s at the BNI. And of course, Greg is a professor of neurosurgery, otolaryngology, and radiology due to his expertise in open and endovascular, cerebrovascular, and in skull base. And of course, uh, at U of Michigan and Ann Arbor. And last but not least, we will be Jim Liu if he makes it out of the OR, Professor and Director of Vascular and Skull Base and Pituitary Surgery at Rutgers in Newark, New Jersey. So uh, it is really a fantastic pleasure to meet my friends again tonight and 
They are, of course, all world experts in the topics that we're going to mm. talk about. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and ask Mike Link to share his, unmute his microphone, and start his presentation. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Jacques. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. See if I can get my audio visual to work. And I think I have to swap. Yes. Um, you're just seeing my title slide now? Now you're good, doctor. Just great. To great. And you can hear me OK? We can see the video and we can hear you correctly. Fantastic. Um, uh, uh, thanks. Thanks again, Jacques. Thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, I am going to speak about a posterior petrosal approach uh, for access to petroclival meningiomas. I don't have any uh, financial disclosures, but I probably have to admit that I have a disclaimer and it might get my uh, membership in the Skull Base Society revoked. But I have to admit that I am not curing petroclival meningiomas. And when I was a fellow with Dr. John Tu at the University of Cincinnati, I was very optimistic that the posterior petrosal approach was gonna be the magic, was gonna be the key to being able to get all of these tumors out. But over the years, I've certainly learned their involvement of critical neurovascular structures uh, makes it almost guaranteed that it's going to be an aggressive subtotal resection. And I know that's not a popular thing to say, but I have, to, I have to say that, I think. Um, there's lots of access to the petroclival region. So everybody knows about the retrosigmoid approach. Uh, you can access some tumors just through a standard middle fossa. You can widen that with an anterior petrosectomy. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about uh, briefly today is the posterior petrosal approach. You can do a partial labyrinthectomy. Um, I have to say we're not big fans of that, but it gives you a few extra millimeters. If the hearing is already gone or you or the patient are willing to sacrifice hearing, you can get rid of the labyrinth and that really increases the uh, amount of working room at the petroclival junction, frankly. And it's almost historical purposes now, um, but if you mobilize the facial nerve completely out of the fallopian canal, cut GSPN, close the external ear canal, you can drill right down to the clivus, uh, although we rarely ever do that anymore. And this is a, a figure from Rob Jackler's book, but this just shows the trajectory we're all familiar with, with the retrosigmoid approach. You can see it's a very long reach to the petroclival junction. So you can shorten it significantly by going pre-sigmoid, but keeping the labyrinth intact so you have a chance of preserving hearing. If you drill through the labyrinth, it widens the exposure, shortens the working distance. But of course, you've sacrificed hearing and vestibular function on that side. And once again, you can really get a lateral trajectory uh, if you go transcochlear. So this has been debated as long as certainly I've been involved in neurosurgery. What's the best approach for a petroclival meningioma? And I've come to look at it as one of those questions like, which of your children do you like the most? Or what's your favorite wine? And of course, the answer is it depends, right? It depends on the extent of the tumor, um, what the preoperative deficits are, what are you and the patient willing to sacrifice to achieve tumor reduction and so on. So I don't think that there's a true right answer to that. And it, the point was never brought home more clearly to me then many years ago, uh, I got to be uh, involved in a symposium in Abu Dhabi at the United Arab Emirates. And this was the panel discussing petroclival meningiomas. Professor Al Mefti, who was talking about the pre sigmoid approaches, Professor Kowase, who was talking about the anterior petrosal approach, and Professor Sami, who was talking about the retro sigmoid approach. And I'm sure included in these three guys' experience, and nobody will be able to match uh, uh, what they have accomplished in their careers, and they couldn't agree. So I'm gonna just go out on a limb and say, we're probably not going to agree on a consensus tonight. And then we also have to look at the patient's anatomy. So for instance, um, if you want, if the patient had no hearing with this tumor and you said, well, I'm gonna go translabyrinthine or, or 
do a posterior petrosectomy approach, this is a terrible head for that. You can see that the, basically there's no room here to work pre-sigmoid. You'd be much better off going post-retrosigmoid. Uh, here you can see a very high jugular bulb. So if you come in through a transmastoid approach, you're going to run right into the jugular bulb. So anatomy does affect uh, what we're going to do. The advantage of this approach is it does shorten your working distance. It gives you a more direct lateral view of the brainstem. The thing I like about it very much is it communicates the middle and the posterior cranial fossa as well. And it allows for a more, let's say, ventral reach around the anterior brainstem without having to put any pressure on the brainstem. The disadvantage is the drilling takes somewhere between 45, and I've seen it take as long as two hours, honestly, it puts the transverse sigmoid sinus at much more risk compared to, let's say, a retrosigmoid approach. And of course, the disaster that can happen is a tear in a dominant vein of the bay. There's a greater potential risk for CSF leak because we're going to open the antrum to the middle ear. Whether or not the hearing is at more risk, I think, is quite debatable. And you certainly need a fat graft to obliterate the defect at the end, again, compared to, let's say, a standard retrosigmoid approach. Um, I'm quite happy right now to announce that uh, we've established the Rote Neurosurgery and Otolaryngology Surgical Anatomy Program here at Mayo Clinic. Um, today would have been Dr. Roten's 89th birthday. He actually started his career here at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Maria Paracelda was one of our skull base fellows a few years ago, and we recruited her now back on staff. And Chris Graffio, was our skull base fellow last year, one of our residents here. He's now working with Mike Lawton down at the BNI. But these dissections I'm going to show you now were done uh, in, our, in our laboratory here in Rochester. And so this is just looking at the left side. This is the incision that I commonly use for a posterior petrosal approach. I just guess basically where the transverse sinus is by connecting a point between the zygoma and the inion. The sigmoid follows the digastric groove. Take the scalp and muscle down to expose the squamous temporal bone, the mastoid, the occipital bone. Make a quite large burr hole over the transverse sigmoid junction, so you're exposing middle fossa dura, posterior fossa dura. Another burr hole straddling the tra mid transverse sinus, a burr hole here and a burr hole at the root of the zygoma. Connect them with the craniotome. Remove your bone flap, and this is what you should be looking at, the transverse sigmoid sinus turning down, temporal dura, retrosigmoid dura in your mastoid. Then you do a wide mastoidectomy, and you keep drilling until you open the antrum of the middle ear here. You can see the incus. This is the horizontal semicircular canal, a more blown up view. You can see the hard cortical bone of the inner ear here, the posterior semicircular canal here. This is the incus, the short process points to where the facial nerve makes its turn at the inferior border of the lateral semicircular canal. Actually, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve you can see in here. Just a more um, expanded view after we skeletonize the semicircular canals horizontal posterior superior semicircular canal. We leave a little bit of bone here while we do this to protect the sigmoid sinus, but then that bone has to be removed. This is the endolymphatic sac here, the pre-sigmoid dura, temporal dura. We open this pre-sigmoid dura and we oversew the endolymphatic sac to try and make sure we don't uh, lose all the endolymph and run the risk of uh, hearing loss. And then we open the subtemporal dura here. So we have the superior petrosal sinus exposed. We doubly ligate that. You can elevate the temporal lobe and see the fourth nerve. We wanna make sure we cut the tent behind where the fourth nerve enters the tent so we don't cut the fourth nerve. So this is now the key is cutting the tent all the way to the incisure. That allows you to retract back the transverse sigmoid junction um, and really opens up this uh, exposure here. And this is the view that we get. So this is the seventh, eighth cranial nerve complex. This is the fifth nerve. 
you can see the ninth nerve, upper rootlets of the vagus nerve here. Uh, this is the um, fourth nerve here entering the tentorium, pica, superior cerebellar arteries, uh, more close up uh, view. And all of this uh, uh, work can be found in our uh, publication from uh, 2019 uh, in uh, Skullbase, if you want the reference, uh, there it is. And I just wanna show a case uh, why we use this pro approach or what it's like um, to operate on this. So this is a 40 year old woman from uh, the great state of Iowa who uh, had about nine months of right facial numbness, some right-sided tinnitus, but you can see she has excellent hearing, normal hearing, and two months of new onset headache. And uh, she got an MRI scan and it shows what looks like a pretty classic petroclival meningioma. You can see it kind of pushing the pituitary stalk forward, coming up under the optic chiasm and right optic tract. And on coronals, you can see it's sitting under the chiasm next to the pituitary stalk. So when I look at this, I say, well, it seems to me about half this tumor is above the tent and about half the tumor is below the tent. So an approach where we're going to cut the tentorium communicates those spaces very well. You can see here its relation to the internal auditory canal. And I think I should probably stop there and say, I don't doubt also that all of us might argue about what truly is a petroclival meningioma. And, and I think we could spend the whole two hours arguing about that where maybe somebody else would say, well, this is really a petrotentorial meningioma or a CP angle meningioma. And I don't know how we're gonna get past that, but I would call this a petroclival meningioma with some extension into Meckel's cave. This is just what it looks like on the T2, compressing the brainstem, fortunately, fortunately pushing the basilar with the brainstem. So there's no separation between the basilar and the brainstem. That's a good, good sign that we can, we can do good work with this uh, tumor and not a lot of edema. So we're hoping we're gonna have a decent plane with the brainstem. And I'll see, so this is a left-sided approach. Uh, um, uh, no, I think you right, mean right sided. Right sided. Right? I'm sorry. This is the right sided approach. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Uh, this is the endolymphatic sac and duct. This is down towards the jugular bulb. And this is the right transverse, right sigmoid sinus. Once we get the exposure done, we want to protect those. I just put a little surgicel on there to make sure they don't get dried out and instruments don't catch and tear them. Um, obviously, you have to be careful with the craniotomy that, um, that you preserve those. So now we have temporal dura up here, pre-sigmoid dura here. And so I open by cutting across the endolymphatic sac as close to the sigmoid sinus as I feel I dare. Um, and then I kind of hold it closed with my forcep as I open this pre-sigmoid dura exposing the right side of the cerebellum. This is the superior petrosal sinus here. So we cut just parallel to that. So we make this flap that we can base anteriorly. And then I'm just gonna sew this endolymphatic sac shut. So I uh, hopefully don't run the risk of losing hearing just from manipulating that. And I think this is very safe. I can't say I've ever thought that I've lost hearing just because of cutting across the distal endolymphatic sac. So we just figure of eight that close and tack it up. And like every other operation that uh, we do, we uh, first look in and open up some arachnoid to get some CSF off. And then that just relaxes everything. You can look in and see that's the uh, eighth cranial nerve there. And I'm just opening the arachnoid above it. And now I open the temporal dura. So this is the transverse sigmoid junction here. And of course, I'm looking for this, right? The vena labae. Uh, so I wanna make sure that I have that um, well identified, that I can protect it. I don't put it on too much stretch as we're gonna work. 
And so now I just want to gently lift up the temporal lobe and find that tentorial incisura. So I just uh, roll this telfa here along the tentorium, looking for the incisura. So I have my trajectory of how I'm going to cut the tent. And as you know, the tent curves upward. So I change my angle a little bit. And there it is. So there's the incisura. For some of these petroclival tumors, you'll run into tumor right here, which makes it a little bit more difficult. This one didn't have that. And then I clip, I doubly ligate the uh, superior petrosal sinus with a couple of clips. You can uh, sometimes just coagulate it. Um, and you can uh, sometimes uh, suture ligate it, but I just like these, uh, these clips. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me get back to where I was. There we go. So now we just want to cut the tentorium all the way to the incisure. It's always a bloody proposition to do this. The tent bleeds a lot, particularly when there's a tumor. But we can just keep cutting and coagulating and cutting and coagulating. And the point is eventually we got to look for that fourth nerve. Oops, sorry. And so there's the fourth nerve. So I've identified it and it really opens up this space now. So this is the fifth nerve partially encased in tumor. The tumor is mostly medial to it. So that, I think justifies me calling this a petroclival meningioma. This is the eighth nerve down here. And so uh, I first wanna get kind of the lay of the land here. And now I'm going below the eighth nerve, looking for the sixth nerve. And this may be a little bit of the Achilles heel of this operation. It's harder to see the sixth nerve pre-sigmoid compared to retrosigmoid. But here I can see now between the eighth nerve and the fifth nerve, I can see the sixth nerve going into Dorello's canal, pretty much surrounded by tumor. And this is one of the reasons why I admit defeat that I'm going to end up leaving a little tumor behind. Because in the past, when I have tried to coagulate and resect this and dig this sixth nerve out of this, I usually end up with a sixth nerve palsy. So I tend to leave a little tumor now around Dorello's canal, right where sixth nerve is going in. So this is working above the fifth nerve between five and four, which is up here. And this is now a really quite nice large space, gives me a lot of tumor to work on. So we just coagulate and make a big window into the tumor. This was a pretty fibrous uh, tumor. So it's a little bit hard to to get it debulked, but we make a pretty good window in there and then we can take the, the sonopet or ultrasonic aspirator and uh, try and really um, hollow it out so we can roll it up off the brainstem. You can see it's a pretty average vascularity for a meningioma, not too bad. I don't usually embolize these, um, but I know some people do and if you're a radiologist, we'll do that all the better. So now this is looking up. So this is now the fourth nerve as it's running up towards the tentorium. And I wanna free up all the arachnoid around that. I want that fourth nerve not to be tethered because I know that it's gonna take a bit of a beating in this operation. We're gonna be working above it and below it. And we're gonna try and remove a lot of tumor from along the tentorial edge. So I wanna make sure it's free. Hey, Mike, two minutes. Okay, great. Um, so this is now working up around the fourth nerve. So we dig the tumor out of there. Some more tumor around the sixth nerve. And what I want to show is now the advantage of this approach is this is now the tent. This is the temporal lobe elevated. And we can really work nicely on this component that goes above the tent. This is uh, digging the fourth nerve out. And then as we push the fourth nerve down with some gel foam, 
we can then really work up and we'll get the third nerve freed up in a good view here of the third nerve. And so we can get all this supratentorial tumor out. and work along the tent edge. And so there we are with the third nerve and all this other tumor can come out. There's the third nerve freed up. And this is the pre-op scan on the left and the post-op scan on the right. And this is where the sixth nerve was coming into Dorello's canal. And this is where I've kind of gotten uh, a bit, um, less aggressive, let's say. And as we go up, you can see I've gotten the brainstem decompressed. I left a little tumor in Meckel's cave. But the thing I like about this approach is it allows me to get all of this tumor out, you know, off the back of the carotid, off the back of the optic chiasm and optic tract. And as we go forward here on the coronals, you can see now the pituitary stalk is free. I was able to get that component out. Just to show you, this is the post-op post, uh, post -op diffusion. There's no stroke or ischemia uh, from that. This is the three-month post-op audiogram. So we preserved a hearing in this case. And I just wanna make a pitch for our lab, for all the residents who are tuned in or fellows, we do have a six month uh, anatomical research fellowship that Dr. Paracelda is directing. We also have some shorter training periods if somebody wants to come and just learn a single approach. And uh, we have a course coming up in June. Um, the snow is almost all completely melted by June. It did snow a little bit today, I have to admit, but not too bad. Um, so that's really what I wanted to go over. I think it's, uh, I think it's a good approach um, for these tumors. Uh, we kind of favor it uh, for these tumors that span the tentorium. And uh, thank you once again, uh, Jacques, for the opportunity to present. And I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. That, that's fantastic, Mike. Uh, beautiful anatomical dissection, beautiful surgery, very well-reasoned approach. And as always, we, we like to save the questions till the end uh, when we discuss uh, everything together. So I'll uh, invite now Nick to share his, Nick Bambakidis to share his slides and continue on the topic of his uh, thinking about uh, petrocleival meningiomas. Thanks, Jacques. Uh, can you hear me okay and see my screen? Yes, very well. It, it's always very intimidating to follow Mike Link and talking about these kinds of tumors. Um, uh, but it, I think it'll be what I'll discuss is a little bit of a variation of a theme, and 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 top uh, some of the same topics will come up over and over again as I sort of give you uh, an idea of how we think about treating these tumors because they are very heterogeneous. The anatomy is difficult. Uh, Harvey Cushing termed it the bloody angle. It was obviously a significant conundrum in terms of how to address lesions in this anatomic area in the pre-microsurgical um, time point. And so I think um, when you think about it, Mike was right. It's a, it's a continuum of approaches from retrosigmoid, which most neurosurgeons are very comfortable with through the transtrosal and combined approaches and even the far lateral approaches, which I won't touch on uh, here today. So the goal I think is really to, to give you again, an idea of the variation, similar themes um, that we'll discuss. It's very complicated and show different cases really with some nuances um, in just a few minutes to give you again, uh, uh, an idea of how you can come up with a simple algorithm that you can think about, especially early on in your training to help guide your decision-making. And again, just keep in mind, I think all the panelists will agree, the primary consideration in how much of a resection you get is not the approach you choose so much as it is obviously the tumor consistency, number one, and then number two, the involvement of the neurovascular structures uh, far outweigh, again, what, whatever approach you decide to use. So um, simple case here, you can see a 45-year-old woman with hearing loss and dizziness, like an acoustic tumor. Most 
folks are very comfortable dealing with this in typical fashion, classic retro sigmoid approach popularized by Danny, not that different, frankly. Um, and then was originally described, you can see the corridor, we're again, all very comfortable with it. It's a pretty deep uh, opening. I won't go through and belabor the technique. Um, I think everyone's pretty comfortable with it. The view you get um, is again, one that we're uh, very uh, used to seeing, pretty nice exposure. Once you can get the cerebellum relaxed, use facial nerve monitoring intradural intracanalicular drilling if you're taking an acoustic tumor we tend to use the retro sigmoid approach for uh, large tumors that don't have favorable favorable anatomy uh, for a trans lab approach that uh, mike mentioned or for smaller tumors in which case you're trying to preserve uh hearing you can see here i won't bore you with all the tumor resection aspects of it but identifying the facial nerve and then um in a particular point during the case having our ENT colleagues come in uh, and do some integral bone work to get the proximal uh, end of the tumor and I, IAC drilled out and that lets you get the tumor out. So again, standard workhorse operation. Most neurosurgeons are very familiar with it uh, and, and can be very useful for tumors that are entirely lateral to the, to the IAC. Um, what about large tumors? Um, can you use the retro sigmoid in combination with other approaches? The answer is yes. Uh, avoiding a petrosectomy, and I've done that a few times over the years. Here's one example, a 40-year-old woman with a large petroclival meningiome. You can see spanning both posterior middle fossa components. And here you can do a stage procedure, an orbitozygomatic approach to get the supertentorial component, and follow that by uh, a retro sigmoid approach to get the posterior fossa component with uh, residual tumor in the cavernous sinus can be managed uh, with radiosurgery as needed. So very reasonable alternative to petrosectomies that we'll use on occasion. Uh, Mike mentioned the translabyrinthine approach, very classic, um, used for something like this, 66-year-old woman, hearing loss and tinnitus. Again, as Mike showed, um, the issues here, are loss of hearing, and you do work around the seventh nerve, particularly as you get more aggressive, but it is all pre-sigmoid. And the fact is, in our experience, patients wake up, you know, having had more of an ear operation than a brain operation, I like to say, in, in terms of their post-operative course. Again, it's all pre-sigmoid and the operating corridor is, is a little shorter. Um, and so I think the takeaway here, when you're learning to do these for acoustic tumors, the fact is you, you do have to get used to the fact, and you can see here Dr. Mowry, one of our four neurotologists at UH, uh, drilling this out for us. The time involved is longer, a uh, couple hours. And then the working corridor in the space is much narrower than what you may be used to with a retro sigmoid approach. You can see here uh, the proximal portion of the tumor, but the, the entire operation is in the pre-sigmoid space. So you get really good, taking acoustics out this way uh, but there is a there is a learning curve involved just because you don't have uh, nearly as much room and i'm sure all the surgeons that do these a lot uh, will tend to agree with that assessment but you can get these larger tumors out yeah, again it takes a little bit more time a little more patience um, but you're not working around the cerebellum and uh, the incision is shorter and patients frankly um, get out of the hospital a little quicker at least in our experience now, what about these larger tumors? Can you do these through a trans uh, translabyrinthine, transpatrol approach? The answer is yes. When I do them, I like to expand this a little bit and do what uh, Mike showed, which is to expose the middle fossa dura. You can see making larger incision. Uh, sure, retro sigmoid, very reasonable. Uh, in this case, though, we decided to do a craniotomy. You can see middle posterior fossa dura. Uh, again, Dr. Mowry drilling off the mastoid. Can you guys see the video okay? Is it playing all right? Yes, it's good, Nick. It's very good. Um, I'm just trying to not belabor and get right to the scenes because given the time constraints, you can see here the middle fossa dura is open and we're coming, we're down right on tumor. So again, large acoustic tumor sends up to the tentorium. Uh, you just want to get a little more room. So for here, 
We'll go ahead and open the middle fossa dura since it's completely exposed. You can see the temporal lobe there and um, cutting the tentorium and dividing it. And that opens up that space. You can get over the top pole of the tumor so you're not pulling down on the superior cerebellar artery or, or the trigeminal nerve. And you can see the fifth nerve deep in the field. So that's another option. It is a little bit more time intensive. It does involve, again, working around the transverse sigmoid sinuses. I like to joke with our fellows, if you're not comfortable with venous sinus bleeding, skull base surgery probably isn't for you. Um, so uh, it it's, uh, just really comes with the territory. And again, just a, an, I, uh, an idea of how much extra room we have. Uh, it's comparable to our retrosigmoid uh, approach. The other point I think is important to make is the closure is part of the operation that you just can't um, minimize with a transit approach. You really have no great way of sealing um, the dura, so fat, sealant, uh, uh, more fat, suspenders, belts, whatever it takes, lumbar grains, uh, help minimize your CSF leak rate. Um, so again, here's what we're talking about in terms of uh, the progression, retro labyrinthine in itself, we rarely use um, to the trans labyrinthine approach. Again, get to the IAC and then the trans cochlear variation, again, rarely used. I'll show you a couple examples which can be combined by opening up the tentorium. Uh, hearing preservation is also something that's very important, uh, something that we always consider. This is a woman with, again, a medium sized meningioma spanning middle and posterior cranial compartments with intact hearing. So here, if you're gonna do a transpetrosal approach, uh, which I think is a great option, just because of the location of the tumor, you wanna probably leave the semicircular canals. And so here, middle fossa durus to the left, posterior fossa durus here to the bottom of the screen. And so you're doing a partial mastoidectomy leaving most of the labyrinth. And you can see the result of that is even once you open the tentorium, you can access the brain surface and the basilar artery and start taking out the subtemporal portion of the tumor, um, but you're still limited somewhat by this bony protuberance of the labyrinth, as you can see to the right. Um, and so you, it's just a little bit of a pain. You can get to the basilar arteries, you can see there, uh, but you are you are working around that bone. Um, so that's an important consideration. You can see at the end of the closure what that looks like. And you're working in the posterior fossa or deep to the seventh and eighth nerves, the rest of that tumorotic. But again, this bony labyrinth is kind of in your way. Uh, but you can still get a good result, as shown here. And this is another example of a 46 year old woman, intact hearing. She had a large cavernoma uh, for which she presented with multiple episodes of hemorrhage and uh, hemiparesis. So we did the same type of approach. And I show this case, this is with Dr. Uh, Cliff McGarian who has since gone on actually to become CEO of, of UH now, so I can't get him in the operating room anymore, but we did a bunch of great cases uh, before he ascended to that role. And you can see here, we've done the craniotomy, and then he's drilling the, the temporal bone, but he's gonna leave a bony labyrinth to preserve hearing. And again, compressing you know a couple hours of drilling. But you can opening the dura then in the subtemporal space, identifying the trochlear nerve, superior cerebellar, cerebellar artery, this is all subtemporal here. The, the tentorium's already been divided. You can see here on the top, there's that bone that I'm kind of working around. And I, I came back to him and I said, Cliff, we need a little bit more room here. I can't get to the brain from this thing is exophytic. So he outlined, skeletal, skeletonized the the uh, the labyrinth and even I, even I think took the horizontal canal, uh, which in most cases still preserves hearing. And now I have much more room to get this thing out and work. Uh, between the lower cranial nerves, deep to the seventh and eighth nerve. And this is where I think you really get benefit from having that extra room. You can see the basilar artery and the AIca coming out all exposed there. You can still get this view even, even again with the hearing preservation uh, operation. You can see at the end, you know, these things always seem to get bigger as you get them out. Um, taking this out. Could you all have done this all through a retrosigmoid approach? Yeah, I think that would have been very reasonable or even some folks purely subtemporally. Uh, but for us in here, it, this was a good 
uh, alternative with a good result. Um, when you don't have hearing, as with this very large meningioma, now you don't have to worry about that bony labyrinth, 40 year old guy with gait trouble and hearing loss. So here, all that bone can go away. And suffice it to say, I'll just show again here with that bone gone, how much more room you have middle fossa dura to the right, posterior fossa dura to the, uh, to the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then one more caveat here, uh, Mike showed, and I've showed how you can cut the petrosal sinus with wet clips. Um, just be sure your wet clips go all the way across the sinus. It's not a huge deal, but again, you just gotta be comfortable with venous bleeding if you're gonna do these kinds of things, cause you're just gonna get into a situation where it can get very bloody and you can see here, just, well, oh, whoops, you know, just not a big deal. Just gotta get your clips across it, get it occluded. We've all been there and divide it. Then you can get the tumor out. And again, big view, um, bads were already there, but all this labyrinth is gone. And that's what gives you that additional, um, uh, that additional room in which you can work. Uh, so again, landmarks for surgical approach, easy sort of way to talk about this with our trainees, residents, and fellows, the IAC and Pentorium uh, uh, are two of your landmarks in the coronal plane. And and then you can, from there, sort of divide tumors up into lateral, medial to the IAC, superior, inferior to the Tentorium, <clears throat> where you might consider Okay, for a lesion like this, a stage OZ retrosig or a transpetrosal uh, as an alternative, again, depending on hearing. Uh, and again, a simple sort of way to think about these anatomic location, posterior fossa alone, lateral to the IAC, retrosig perverse choice, medial to the IAC, hearing preservation, hearing assessment, I should say, is our next thought. If it's useful hearing, again, that's a neurologic uh, definition. Uh, retrosigmoid or attempted canal sparing transpetrosal, no useful hearing transpetrosal. If the tumor is posterior and middle and in the middle cranial fossa, again, a hearing assessment. If there's no hearing, uh, combined approaches are in the in our wheelhouse. If there is useful hearing, you're a little bit more, more limited. Um, so again, simple algorithm, again, does depend on having a very good expert neuroautological team to help you. And we've done this for a series of large tumors with reasonable results. And those common complications tend to be transient or even permanent new cranial neuropathies related to the approaches. So I'll just show you a couple and with a couple of the transcochlear approaches we've done in the last year. Again, as Mike mentioned, rarely required. But in this case, we had a 23-year-old man, cardiac arrest, vocal cord paralysis, absent hearing on the left, already with a weak face. He's got a collision situation here with a clival meningioma and a huge acoustic. Uh, so we decided this kind of case, maximal exposure was the way to go. Uh, here's sort of the way this looks from an anatomic standpoint. When you combine it, you can see how much room you have. Uh, for this kind of thing I did with Dr. Mowry, uh, at this point, you can either do it all in a single stage. I'd be interested to hear what the panel uh, experience is uh, or stage it over two separate surgical procedures. I've gone to staging it in the last few we've done. Uh, in day one, you can get the bone work done uh, pretty easily, be done at a reasonable hour and then come back with a fresh team the next day uh, to do all the tumor work. Uh, rather than work into the wee hours of the night with, in my experience, the OR team is not exactly uh, at their best. And that's really where you can get into trouble. So this is how we've done it. Um, you can see here drilling out the facial nerve. There's transposing the facial nerve. When you do that, you're going to get uh, facial weakness, at least a grade three. This patient had that already, so um, it was not a huge addition in morbidity. And, but you have to close off the external canal being done. Now opening the tentorium tem temporal lobe there, pre fossa dura uh, open, and then putting uh, some plastic sheeting over the or and closing, then coming back the next day, reopen everything using this little piece of, this is a nice little trick actually, that uh, piece of uh, 
plastic. I'm not sure um, where the ENT folks brought it out, but it was really nice in identifying where the facial nerve was. Uh, so you could preserve it during the section of the acoustic first, you can see here. And then finally, when that's out, um, working on the meningioma, you see the basilar arteries just sitting right in the middle of your field of view and then working into the clivus. We knew we were not going to get this entire tumor out, but we're able to get a vast majority of it out and decompress everything. Again, the basilar artery, BB junction, uh, all uh, easily seen uh, right in your field of view with a huge, huge opening. You can get to the contralateral uh, third nerve the lower cranial nerves uh, there. And again, closure is a whole part of the operation. Uh, fat graft, um, sealant, more fat graft, more sealant, put your bone back on, lumbar drain um, in an effort to avoid CSF leak and, and promote wound healing. Uh, okay, and next, uh, two, yeah, two did, minutes. Did very well. Yeah, so great. I'll just end with this last case then. Um, uh, Jacques, 65 year man, progressive gait imbalance, facial pain, numbness. Again, another example. We thought this was either a large meningioma or a trigeminal schwannoma. Turned out to be the latter. Uh, you can see from his body habitus. This is a case I did with Alejandro Rivas, who recently joined us from Vanderbilt. Not the, your thinnest guy, so hard to position him. And I think that's a consideration too, because you don't have to do a lot of fancy uh, head maneuvering with a trans petrosal approach. It's really um, supine head turn slightly will get you everything you need. It's really because you have so much bony uh, exposure. And again, similar though, in terms of the way we did this two stage operation, uh, performing the uh, moving the external auditory canal, drilling down again, facial nerve down to the cochlea, removing the cochlea thoroughly closing everything up, coming back the next day. But again, back to my initial point, cutting the tentorium tumors all right here, your, your primary determinant of the degree of resection is the consistency of the tumor and the involvement of neurovascular structures. This was a very fibrous, very firm trigeminal schwannoma. So hours and hours of work, we got a lot of it out even with the amount of room we had, we still could not get, uh, uh, particularly the portions anterior to Meckel's cave out. Uh, but nevertheless, um, again, example of what the view gives you, I think is the real takeaway here. And he, he did well, uh, post-op, there's a closure, large closure, very meticulous, um, with some residual tumor well controlled. And did very well. So again, main risks, got to consider CSF leak, new cranial neuropathies, um, and uh, a good, I can't overemphasize uh, a, a well-oiled skull-based team is a key to having success with these complex uh, trans approaches on the neurosurgical and the otolaryngologist, uh, otolaryngologist. Uh, uh, side of things as well. So I'll stop there, Jack. Try and keep us in time. I know there'll be questions Nick. at the end. Thank you. You had enough material for for hours, of course. And I I know it's not easy to to jump through all these details, but I'm sure the audience will appreciate how much detail and 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 uh, we can we're, we will talk about some of those issues during the discussion. Thank you very much. Some humongous lesions you, you showed us. And I'm, I'm, I can see several questions already building up in the Q&A box. I encourage all of you to keep typing your questions and I will definitely address them at the end. So now uh, I invite uh, Greg Thompson to tell us about his vast experience with acoustic neuromas. Greg, please uh, share your slides. And I don't know if you're gonna, yes, you're gonna talk about middle fossa approach for vestibular schwannomas. Uh, welcome, right. and, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jacques. It's an honor to, to, to be here and uh, discuss this, and, and uh, an honor to follow you know, Mike and, and um, the terrific presentation that uh, Nick did as well. Um, I'm gonna, my my uh, presentation is going to be much more kind of 
uh, select. It's about the technical points for hearing preservation, you know, uh, cranial nerve uh, uh, salvation uh, preservation is something that uh, we, we work on, as Nick pointed out. And, and for small intercanalicular and moderate size intercanalicular and CP angle tumors, this is a, a nice approach. I just want to, I don't have any um, conflicts or anything to disclose other, other than to say these four otologists were um, uh, each surgeons um, from whom I've learned quite a bit. Um, so really, this is just kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk about, the indications, who's an ideal candidate, how to position um, to get the optimal cranial exposure, what are some of the surgery, uh, surgical anatomy and landmarks, um, some beautiful images from um, texts you've all seen, key technical points for hearing preservation and outcomes and summary really briefly. And then if I have time, I'll show a video as well. So uh, the indications, really, it's the middle cranial fossa is useful for small acoustic neuromas. Uh, the largest we've done, I think, is 21 or 22 millimeters, less than 20 generally, and it's best for patients with good hearing. I actually tried this for a larger tumor in a, in a patient who uh, had an NF2, um, and uh, we were not able to save hearing. Uh, it was like 26 millimeter one. So again, the ideal candidate is uh, uh, one who has a uh, you know, small intercanalicular mass. It's not impacted laterally. I'll come back to that again. That's very important. You, you know, sometimes you can get the ones that go all the way out, but they're, they're much harder. Um, and you can see that on this MR on the left. Um, patients with excellent hearing are the best candidates that they have particularly robust ABR waves uh, preoperatively. And also at the time of, uh, of surgery, you'll follow interoperative monitoring with brainstem auditory vocal response, at least for me, is key. And I've learned a lot from uh, interoperative monitoring. And the other thing you want to check preoperatively is whether they have caloric weakness. Someone who has a, you know, when you're testing uh, for caloric weakness, you're really um, uh, testing the, the um, uh, uh, middle uh, um, uh, semi, the um, not posterior, not not inferior, middle, medial, uh, semicircular canal. And um, if you have a, a good, uh, an abnormal response, that indicates it's probably a, a superior vestibular nerve, uh, which is uh, the origin of the tumor. If there's not caloric weakness, uh, then it's more likely an inferior vestibular nerve and therefore more difficult. Um, just to remind you, you know, the standard versus a quasi extended approach or the middle cranial fossa, um, uh, Mike mentioned this as well. This is, uh, you know, the same approach, but just extend for the middle fossa, it's not quite as far extended um, anteriorly. If you look at the original house middle fossa approach where it was uh, described, they used a very small and, and uh, somewhat sometimes difficult uh, straight incision, you know, they're ergonomically, this was um, kind of tiny. And over time, as demonstrated by this two in Van Leveren uh, 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 image drawing, uh, you could see that a wider approach to the floor of the middle cranial fossa really uh, affords a much better, uh, you know, surgical approach with ergonomically a much simpler um, uh, kind of comfortable uh, uh, surgical ease. And, and as we all know, comfort when operating uh, tran translates into uh, better results in general. The position is uh, turned to the lateral, the head turned to the lateral position, usually with the shoulder roll under the uh, ipsilateral shoulder. And the cranial uh, opening should be, as I mentioned, wide for surgical ease. Remember that uh, middle fossa approach is mainly an extradural operation other than that small area we open over the canal and, and the cistern medially. So it's important to avoid dural tears. That can be more difficult in an elderly patient who has a lot of irregularity on the middle fossa. So it's, it's worthwhile after you place the burr holes to undercut them a little bit and reach under and do a very good dural dissection. Um, and it's important to know the, uh, the surgical landmarks and we'll, we're gonna go over those here. Just briefly, because as uh, uh, one of my mentors used to say in Pittsburgh, repetition is the memory of, pardon me, is the mother of learning. Um, so just briefly, this is how the otologists see it. They, they, they um, identify, uh, well, we identify for them typically the location of the geniculate ganglion and the 
uh, greater superficial petrosal nerve in the floor of the middle fossa. We dissect extradurally, so sharply over GSPN to leave it sitting along the geniculate on the floor and, and dissect from posterior um, anterior. The posterior marker we're looking for is the uh, arcuate eminence, which represents a superior semicircular canal. And then um, the middle, uh, we're going to dissect anteriorly uh, along GSP until we see middle meningeal artery and, and uh, bipolar and, and divide it above the foramen spinosum. And uh, the otologists think of really the area just um, anterior and posterior to this. Uh, the IC is uh, is a safe area, so they'll 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 basically bisect the angle between the the superior semicircular canal and the GSPN, and um, that'll identify for them knowing where the geniculate is as they work medial. The dissection actually is drilled from medial to lateral. They need the the tip of the retractor over the petrous bone. And um, the anatomy there, uh, like I said, you start with geniculate ganglion and go to GSPN, find middle meningeal artery, foramen spinosum. V3 in the foramen ovale is kind of the anterior extent. You don't need to go any further than that. You bisect that angle, as I just said, and then um, uh, define by the bisection of the, of the angle between the arcuate eminence and GSPN, the, the location of the IAC. The drilling is from medial to lateral. On the lateral aspect, they'll define Bill's bar. Um, anterior uh, to which is a facial nerve and posterior is the uh, superior um, vestibular nerve. Um, <clears throat> um, anteriorly, there's a basal turn of the cochlea. And again, posteriorly, um, the arcuate eminence will have an underlying superior semicircular canal. This, um, photo from one of the rodent dissections nicely demonstrates that GSPN and geniculate should be left down. You do that by dissecting the dura uh, from posterior to medial and gently lift it up. And really what you're trying to do is expose this area medial to GSPN for drilling of the IC. The important part is to identify the anatomy once the otologist has drilled the uh, internal auditory canal. And uh, an important, obviously, the easiest thing to do is identify the facial nerve. It's usually anteriorly. Sometimes it can be pushed posteriorly by the tumor, but it's usually anterior. And you want to sharp, do a sharp dissection on the backside of that um, and uh, let, let the arachnoid on the anterior side gently um, carry that facial nerve anteriorly. You will see nervous intermedius in between. Um, and then typically the superior vestibular nerve is on top or, you know, the origin of the tumor. Um, and then the anterior inferior part of the canal, as you look at it, would be uh, the, the cochlear nerve. So the posterior part of the canal, the superior and inferior vestibular nerves is really where you want to uh, begin your working. Um, and so again, here's just a, a photo of the uh, a good place to anchor the bone is on the medial aspect of the petrous uh, tip. This is a, still an extradural operation at this point. And the uh, otologist is going to uh, use those landmarks we mentioned to drill there. So um, to me, the, the emphasis on this really is about um, what do you do when you get to the internal auditory canal in terms of the um, exposure? What's the, what's the what is the choreography of the dissection? A lot of people ask this. And so one of the first things I do once I get there is uh, I feel under that lateral aspect um, using a, a Hitzelberger or some instrument to reach under and see if I believe that it's as far as far enough as, as the otologist does. Sometimes I'll say, gosh, I think you have two or three millimeters to go. Um, and you can get a very good sense of that just by uh, probing first. Um, other times you'll find that it's potato chip thin and a little angle curette you can, you can uh, use to extend that uh, laterally. Um, sometimes if it's a dehiscent geniculate ganglion, you'll have a very clear visual idea of how far lateral you are. But the key is to make sure that you have both the lateral and the uh, posterior exposure maximized. And then um, again, you wanna um, make that sharp dissection on the posterior side of the facial nerve, let the arachnoid intact, sweep it with maybe a number six or geneta just to um, follow it along the tumor that's um, usually elevating the facial nerve. And then identify if it's a, if it's a uh, superior vestibular nerve, you can usually 
look around the tumor and see the facial nerve. And then also the, the um, lateral aspect, you can see uh, where the superior vestibular nerve goes in posterior to Bill's bar and then also medial. A good thing to do um, once you have the facial nerve kind of um, moved bucket handle style uh, anteriorly away from, you know, gently over the top of the tumor is to then divide the superior vestibular nerve um, and then start working on the debulking the tumor. Um, with a medial, I should buy, uh, and mention, by the way, that when you're doing that sharp dissection, you want to dissect from medial to lateral, because if you go from lateral to medial, you're going to be pulling um, on that nerve where it's fixed in a bony um, uh, canal rather than medially where it's an arachnoid. So again, uh, medial to lateral is the direction to uh, dissect. Um, once the superior vestibular nerve has been uh, divided uh, uh, media or laterally, it can also be more easily elevated and you can cut it um, uh, medially and expose the tumor. At this point, oftentimes you can really see. So for instance, in this image below, you can, I don't know if you can tell with the color, but you can see this is a facial nerve and it has a very clean margin and it's a little bit more um, pale white than the typical tumor uh, with the superior vestibular nerve over the top of it uh, posteriorly. But the, the key is once that facial nerve is, is moved as far as it can comfortably go um, um, anteriorly, um, you wanna lyse the arachnoid ad 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 adhesions on the superior vestibular nerve after it's been cut and then really expose with its P arachnoid of the tumor intact and to bulk on the posterior side of the tumor. It's very important to operate in the posterior side of the canal because of course on the anterior side, you have not only facial, but deep to that, the, the cochlear nerve. And so you carry out um, uh, a kind of um, debulking if it's large enough, uh, but also uh, dissection, kind of maintaining the P arachnoid, trying to keep the, the nerves in their arachnoid plane. Um, that is the facial nerve and the cochlear nerve deep internally to bulk the tumor and then work from uh, medial to lateral. Um, also, uh, the, a key is to avoid use of the bipolar um, and, and use tamponade. And one thing I found over and over is that, um, you know, these, these are not wires, but they are carrying uh, obviously a uh, impulse, which if you're manipulating a nerve, it's going to go into desynchrony. And if you start to get a change and you think, gosh, I haven't done much on that cochlear nerve except for um, you know, some very gentle blunt dissection and you're starting to lose it. A couple of things to think about would be blood pressure and then just giving it time to be, to resynchronize. And so um, check the blood pressure. I, I have multiple times seen when the blood pressure is in the 100 to 110 systolic range for a given patient, that may not be enough. For some reason, it seems to be particularly surprisingly um, less well tolerated in, in uh, young people. Uh, particularly children. And so if you um, push the blood pressure up 10 or 20 points, often the BSR will come back. Um, and even if you wait, um, sometimes uh, just um, give it a little time with resynchronization, you'll get a better uh, you know, form and uh, less uh, delay uh, and latency shift. So um, that these are the, the uh, I'd say the major um, issues with uh, cranial nerve management for for hearing preservation. Just to highlight again, sharp dissection, medial to lateral uh, dissection. Work on the posterior side of the internal auditory canal first. Avoid the bipolar, and pay attention very carefully and be patient with the uh, brainstem auditory evoked response. So I'm going to see if I can. Um, I've jumped through my slides as fast as I could go, Jacques, just because I want to show a little bit of the video if I can. Uh, Don't worry, you're, you're good, you're good. You've got okay. at least five minutes. Okay, great. So um, let me see if I can just start this here. Yes, so this is a, a patient um, getting a right-sided approach. Um, very important to get the um, electrode set well. I've had a couple of times when uh, exposure was hampered and we had to go back and make sure they were set. And here's the approach, kind of a standard middle cranial fossa approach. It's actually trapezoid rather than U-shaped because you wanna make sure, particularly actually if you're on the left side for most right-handed surgeons, you wanna make sure you get anterior. The otologists, when they're working on the left side, they have to work back 
um, and uh, it's much more uncomfortable for them to drill. So particularly on the left side, the trapezoidal uh, flap tends to, tends to help. Um, and in, in this case, we're just um, uh, making sure that uh, we have a very good dissection along the middle cranial fossa floor. Like I said, it's important if you can to avoid any dural tears, uh, particularly along the base um, and undercut as you make your holes. Um, and then um, I'm using the, the uh, Affelbaum retractor here, a little bit like a, a dissector. And then here I am, I've identified the geniculate uh, ganglion uh, posteriorly where we've stimulated along it. And now we're dissecting medial, the GSPN is along here and we're pushing the dura medial to the um, uh, GSPN along the petrous um, area. So here's, here's GSPN and then the otologist is in drilling and um, he's, he's gonna work in this, in this area on the petrous um, apex um, over the uh, IAC again, if you look at the arcuate eminence, um, superior semicircular canal and GSPN, he's going to um, drill uh, a place that roughly bisects that angle. Um, let me see if I can bring this forward a little bit. And we'll move this along. Um, they use the uh, diamond drill to stop the, the hemorrhage. Um, and it's important that you don't use bipolar actually is when you're under the middle cranial fossa, much better to tamponade as you get near the cavernous sinus. Um, they'll use the diamond drill on bone, but we should really just tampen out with a little bit of thrombin soap gel foam and some cottonoids. It'll stop venous bleeding. Um, like uh, um, Nick said, you just got to get a little comfortable with stopping it and not using your bipolar is really a key. So I'm going to jump through the, the drilling here a little bit um, and then um, see if I can go back to where we're going to start on the um, on the, the uh, dural opening. So uh, here are the, the uh, bony drilling is almost done. And um, we're gonna identify on that last cut, we're gonna identify where the um, facial nerve is on the anterior side of the canal. You can see it's, it's white through the, uh, through the uh, uh, dura, you can even see where it is. And then we're gonna open in the cistern first, drain some cerebral spinal fluid, and then um, work out laterally. It's important when you open to open, if you can, posterior to the facial nerve, just so you don't have any uh, untoward opening or sharp event near the, near the facial nerve. I've changed the way I've done this over time. This is probably five years old, this video, but oftentimes after they're done, they'll have a very small opening um, on the um, posterior side of the facial nerve. And um, that's a really good place and much easier to just pick it up with a 5910, a small sharp instrument. Now I op almost always open from lateral to medial with the dura. Um, and then, and here you can see there's Bill's bar. This is the, um, the, where the facial nerve is going out anterior to Bill's bar. This is that tumor you can see that um, this is the edge coming back here. I'm demonstrating with the stimulator. And so this is gonna be the um, superior vestibular. This is spatial nerve here. We're gonna have some area in between, which is, and you can see I'm doing the dissection from medial to lateral, opening the arachnoid between the facial nerve and the superior vestibular nerve. And then um, it goes all the way down and you can actually see the color change all the way underneath. And here's a facial nerve that we have a nice angle. We can see it actually wrapping around the tumor here as well. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, Greg, uh, uh, one minute, if you can. One minute. Okay. Now I'm going to jump through the rest it's of it. Okay. Two minutes because you're my good friend. Two minutes. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm running behind, but the, now what we're going to do is follow with either Hitzelberger or, or sharp dissection showing the, the facial nerve all the way out. And then we're gonna work on the posterior side of the canal. Again, the posterior side of the canals where the superior vestibular and inferior vestibular are deep. And uh, that's much safer to work there, um, to bulk the tumor there, and then um, do the dissection against the two nerves you're trying to preserve on the anterior side of the canal later. But initially we're just going to bulk this way. And then, um, here we've debulked quite a bit, as you can see, and there's the facial nerve, which has been swung bucket handle around uh, uh, what was the area where the where this thing came out. So 
I think I, I didn't show you the coup de gras there, but um, you get the idea. We're going to use uh, fat to uh, close, and and um, I think that's it, Jacques. Um, um, thanks very much for letting me go through that. Thank you. Beautifully done. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Like if you could stop sharing your slides uh, is a um, very important stepwise explanation of how the middle fossa should be done. Uh, is Jim Liu with us? Yes. Ah, okay. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Yo, go Shall ahead. I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Share your screen and give us your wisdom on vestibular schwannomas. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Jacques. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this and inviting me. It's certainly an honor to be here and to be on this very esteemed panel of uh, friends and colleagues here. Um, so the, the, in the 20 minutes that I'm given, I'm, I'm going to focus just mostly on some technical pearls and some issues and pitfalls focusing on facial nerve preservation for acoustics, particularly the large acoustics, COOS grades three and four, because they tend to be the challenging ones where we encounter uh, decisions. And as you know, the major treatment objectives in acoustic neuroma surgery is getting a gross total resection, if safely possible, and trying to preserve the facial nerve as this is an important aspect of their quality of life. And in recent years, we've seen increased literature of this concept of planned subtotal followed by radiosurgery in an attempt to improve facial nerve function. And this has been called the adaptive uh, hybrid surgery uh, concept. And there, it's, it's uh, gotten some criticism, and, and this is one commentary that you can see is that it's, uh, per, it's, it's giving some license for more non-specialty centers and less experienced surgeons to attempt resection of these large tumors. Here's an example of uh, one of my own. This was a patient with this large tumor and underwent a retrosigmoid approach by, by another uh, surgeon in another facility. And the family was told that uh, they got most of it and the rest is inoperable and we can shrink it with radiation. And so this lady uh, received a large dose of radiation and ended up on a medicine ward quadriparetic and nonverbal with a lot of edema in this large tumor and you could see there's really not much tumor that was really debulked and uh, fortunately we we transferred her over and instead of going through the same retrosigmoid approach we went translab this time and uh, due to the adhesions of the nerve from uh, to the tumor from radiation most likely. I, I trimmed it and, and left a little you know thin carpet of tumor along the course of the nerve and uh, she did well post-op and this is nine years on the scan above nine or ten years now and she went from quadriplegic to ambulating and then regained uh, function and uh, and now she is here nine years now and I saw her recently so she's ten years post-op and she pretty much has a, a normal quality of life. So um, when we think about the, the system, there's a recent systematic review on this concept of the hybrid strategy. And, and if you look at it critically, the debulking is primarily intracapsular. So there's no attempt to come around the outside of the tumor. The follow-up's relatively short, but you know the results look pretty favorable. You know, 93 94% tumor control rate and 96% Brackman 1 and 2 facial nerve results. So they look quite favorable, but I think we have to ask ourselves, is this the best thing for the patient? And some of my own personal criticisms of this approach is that the subtotal is planned. It's already pre-planned prior to surgery, meaning I'm not going to even try to take out the tumor. And the tumor debulking is primarily intracapsular. And that's a problem too, because we, we tend to underestimate how much tumor is left behind, even if you're using image guidance. So it's difficult to assess the volume of reduction. And there's a huge spectrum of subtotals. And, and I'll show you in a moment that not all subtotals are created equal. We're lacking long-term follow-up. So we don't know what's gonna happen in about 10 to 20 years of these tumors. 
and could these be emerging diseases in the next decade to come? And I think we're also forgetting how to do safe and proper facial nerve dissection. And if we as teachers uh, are performing these in our teaching institutions, uh, how will our future trainees learn how to do facial nerve dissection and also tackle other difficult uh, CP angle posterior fossa lesions like this? So I think uh, acoustic neuroma surgery done in the way that you're dissecting off the facial nerve, much like open aneurysm surgery, I think is becoming a lost art. So does it matter how much tumor you leave behind? Well, I think the literature does show that uh, uh, tumor recurrence correlates with the volume of subtotal and it's, it's proportional. So extent of resection does matter. And so this is my, my own classification of subtotals. Uh, less than 95% uh, debulking and you leave a big piece. I call this the chunk. If you leave some tumor where the enhancement is greater than two millimeters or so, it looks more like a carpet. And then this is the what I call the near total where you know as a surgeon you've removed pretty much a good portion of it and you only left a sliver intra-op. And sometimes these are radiographically absent or sometimes they're linear, uh, there's a linear enhancement along the course of the nerve. So this is a, a nice near total removal. So how can we achieve maximal tumor resection and still achieve the best facial nerve outcomes? My own personal strategy is that you go in to the fight with the intention of a gross total removal. So you try to attempt a gross total if safely possible. And the decision to leave tumor behind should be made intraoperatively based on the surgeon's judgment and intraoperative observations and findings due to uh, facial nerve monitoring or uh, tumor adhesion. And that when we leave to, uh, tumor behind, we should try to leave the least amount of residual while still preserving facial nerve function. And in as a result, this leads to you, uh, a, a maximal extent of resection or a radical near total or subtotal removal in effect. One of the techniques that, that I like to use in uh, doing this is this technique dis initially described by Sasaki called the subperineural technique. If you look at this diagram, the tumor is enveloped by the vestibular nerves is wh where they arise. And when the vestibular nerve is on stretch, there's a thin membrane that wraps around the tumor capsule called the perineurium. And this perineurium forms a, a buffer that separates the vestibular nerve from the facial and cochlear nerves. So if you can find your plane of dissection in this plane, you're not dissecting on the facial nerve uh, directly. And I would advise not to work in the subarachnoid space. Work extra arachnoid. You don't need to open up the arachnoid membranes. So you see this clear membrane here. It looks like a thin arachnoid layer, but it's actually the vestibular perineurium. When you're doing these tumors, uh, you, uh, I, I always tell the residents, you undress the tumor and you, and you peel the membranes off of the true tumor capsule as if you're peeling an onion. And this is how you can identify that layer of the perineurium and it looks like a thin clear membrane and it acts like a buffer for protection uh, as you're dissecting off the facial nerve. So do not dissect in the subarachnoid space, it's not necessary. So here's an example of a medium sized acoustic. I like to drill the IAC first and then identify the nerves distally. It, it essentially serves the same advantage of a trans lab by having early distal identification of the facial nerve and then you can have your option of either working on the medial side or the lateral side and we'll initially debulk the center portion of it to allow us to collapse it and here we are picking up the inferior vestibular nerve and finding that perineurium you see how it's got a clear membrane we'll work on the medial side towards the brain stem and if you stay in that layer 
there's going to be a clear membrane covering the brainstem and that really helps you avoid those veins on the brainstem that can uh, tend to bleed. So we'll continue to uh, work around the inferior side then we come around the superior side there's the superior vestibular nerve being peeled off and we'll use this Roten 3 disc dissector to gently dissect right on the tumor capsule peeling that perineurium off the tumor capsule and then finding that last point of adhesion which tends to be just distal to the porous acousticus and then using this McElveen knife will take out that last portion so at the end the resection bed looks like a glove or like a catcher's mitt and it's you don't see the facial nerve but trust that it's there and you could stimulate it and then we'll use an endoscope to make sure there's no tumor distally and then here's the post-op scan you can see a gross total he initially had a Brackman 2 post-op but at six weeks he's already recovered to a Brackman 1 this is a larger tumor we did um, this was recently published in neurosurgical focus large cystic tumors tend to be more challenging they can be more adherent to the facial nerve sometimes more vascular so I generally like to work on the inferior side first I find the 9 and 10 cranial nerves and now I pick up the inferior vestibular nerve here it is right here I will use a scissors to spread to get right underneath that vestibular perineurium and then you could see it starts to separate nicely here I'll use this disc dissector to push right on the tumor capsule and then get into that perineural plane you can see it's like a clear membrane and and this is great this this membrane is like a, a, a I call it the holy veil it it really protects uh, the nerves on the other side of it namely the cochlear and the facial nerve so we're working on the brain stem side here and then we'll go to the top and there's the fifth nerve I've got into the subarachnoid space a little bit here but I'll try to find my way and work my way back underneath the superior vestibular nerve so there's the superior vestibular nerve there and look at that clear membrane there's the facial nerve you see how the facial nerve is behind this clear membrane that's not arachnoid membrane that's the perineurium of the superior vestibular nerve and look how that facial nerve falls away from the tumor capsule and then we'll work on the uh, distal side and then we'll start peeling that tumor away from that perineural layer right at the porous acousticus where it fans out and it gives you that trapezoidal shape and then using sharp dissection we'll find the the tumor adhesions cut the adhesions and on these large tumors this is where I have a lower threshold to leave a little residual so right here this is where it tends to be stuck you can see there's a small little residual right here adherent to the perineurium along the course of the facial so the facial stimulated in this course going superior and then lateral and here he is this is post-op immediately in the recovery room a Brackman one and we preserved his ABR initially but unfortunately at six weeks uh, uh, he lost his hearing eventually but I'm I'm pretty confident I preserved the cochlear nerve so he he would be a good candidate for a cochlear implant which we are uh, currently considering and then here's an example of a trans lab uh, this is the sigmoid sinus on the left side this is a pre sigmoid dural opening and this is a cystic tumor again a pretty challenging and sticky one uh, the thing about cystic tumors you should um, be aware of is sometimes the aica can traverse right through the cystic tumor and it can be right in the middle and uh, y if you're not aware or don't recognize it you could uh, injure the aica and get a, get a get aica stroke so just be cognizant of that this one uh, fortunately did not have that but I have seen several cases uh, of that in these cystic ones uh, so there's the brain stem we're using a, a micro uh, bayonet forceps to really use that uh, spreading technique uh, and then to peel the tumor off of the brain stem and then here's the facial nerve here distally we're getting into that plane separating the tumor capsule from the inferior side and then here's the uh, the facial nerve on the top side going out in the, into the IAC some uh, adhesions from the vestibular nerve sharply incised 
and then here's the course of the nerve coming around using sharp dissection and then peeling it from the inferior side. So here's where um, it tends to be a little bit more sticky and here I'm trimming it leaving a thin rind here along the course of that facial nerve and then debulking is very important I think debulking uh, if you make the tumor smaller it makes it easier to roll the tumor without causing traction on the blind side uh, that you might not be aware of and so here here it is we're picking it up again this is where it tends to be adherent you can see there's a thin little rind right on the perineurium just over the facial nerve and and like Greg said uh, you shouldn't bipolar uh, when you bipolar you can cause a facial nerve injury so a little bit of oozing in the tumor bed I'll just use a Surgicel and just gentle packing and hold some pressure and irrigate with warm saline here it's okay to bipolar it was a branch that was away from the nerve so you bipolar as close to the tumor as possible and then cut closer to the tumor and then we could stimulate the nerve at the end. And so for repair on translabs, I like to use this uh, fascial sling technique, which we had described. You take a piece of fascia lata and uh, you suture it in an interrupted fashion. It creates like a sling, and then you can put your fat graft on it so that on your post-op scan, you don't have this classic uh, finger of fat that goes all the way touching the brain stem. And so this is what it looks like. And then we put a, a med pour plate over it to hold pressure, and this has worked nicely uh, for us. So this is the post-op scan on this gentleman. Uh, he was Brackman 1, and uh, he was a near total. So here are some examples. These were all near totals, and you can see barely visible, maybe a linear enhancement here, but excellent facial nerve uh, results afterwards. And then here are some near total removals. You can see little rind of enhancement along the brain stem this one was a little bit thicker and again very favorable results and what we've been seeing is that we're having more uh, uh, percentages of immediate Brackman 1 and 2 but if you have a Brackman 3 or 4 we're seeing faster recovery to 1 and 2 as early as 6 to maybe 8 weeks rather than waiting 12 months here's a recent case that we did um, big cystic one again with a lot of brainstem compression uh, you can see she's a Brackman 2 post-op and the nerve stimulated at 0.05 I don't have her picture but I saw her at six weeks and she was near completely normal and I anticipate further improvement this is a case where I uh, I had done a near total and it had a linear enhancement but it started to grow and we treated it with radio surgery and despite that the tumor continued to grow so uh, we decided to pull the trigger and, and go back and luckily I was able to, to find that same plane and uh, do a near total removal and uh, here she is uh, in recovery room uh, post-op uh, day, oh, day one and then slight slight droop in the corner of her mouth not too bad her nerve stimulant at 0 0.05 and then here she is at uh, six weeks post-op so I was very happy with this result this is a, an example of a Brackman 3. This was uh, the one I did on my earlier uh, series. I, I probably, in retrospect, maybe uh, leave a little bit more tumor, but you can see this is a, a result I, was, I would say is not as favorable. You can see uh, more disfigurement and asymmetry with a forced smile. So when we looked at our outcomes, we've been using this technique in our last uh, 95 patients or so. I think we're up to about 120 now. but. Uh, Brackman 1 and 2 is quite favorable, 95% and 5% uh, 3 and 4. Majority of these tumors are were the large Coos grade 3 and 4, but we can apply the same technique to the smaller tumors, intracanalicular tumors. And you can see our overall outcome, Brackman 1 and 2 was 95%. The smaller tumors were quite good, 100% Brackman 1 and 2. And then the, as we get larger, uh, it dropped to about 92%. And we, we saw that with the increased uh, tumor size, there was a decreased rate of gross total and an increased rate of near total, which I think reflects our tendency to have a lower threshold to leave tumor behind on, on larger tumors. 
and the impact of extent of resection did not, uh, uh, they had, there was no impact on facial nerve outcome, whether you used a gross total or, or near total, which I think has been consistent with several reports in the literature. Uh, we had one case uh, a recurrent tumor uh, that treated with radio surgery, and um, this, uh, this is old data. We did have one patient we went back for a second debulking, which is the case I showed you. Uh, and, one, uh, one minute, uh, Jim, one minute. Perfect. I'm just about to wrap up. So complications. We did have uh, some complications here. I had two patients who had cerebellar edema. These were retrosigmoid approaches, probably too much uh, retraction some graft site issues, uh, two pseudomeningocele's that we ended up doing an LP shunt, but uh, no uh, incisional leaks. And I think our, our CSF leak has been low, I think largely using these techniques. This is a, a fat graft technique where we, over a retrosigmoid incision, we put a fat graft and then bolster it with a plate. It really prevents any pseudomeningocele. And so if we compare our series to the meta-analysis that I showed you earlier, uh, the, the facial nerve results are, are, are comparable. Um, but of course, we had much lower uh, rate of patients undergoing radiation. So I would argue that this approach is a nerve-centered approach, just as the hybrid uh, school of thought claims. And um, in conclusion, I, I would say that uh, you know, excellent facial nerve can still be achieved while attempting a maximal gross total resection or near total. And the subperineural plane of dissection is a very useful technique. It really provides that buffer to protect the facial nerve. And I think the decision to leave tumor remnant should be based on an intraoperative judgment, not uh, pre-planned. And this approach can be a facial nerve sparing centered approach as well. And I think we have to continue to raise the bar for our microsurgical techniques so we can train our future generation of skull-based surgeons. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim. Another spectacular uh, presentation, four out of four. Um, thank you guys very much for, for all this. So now, um, probably what we should do next is uh, you know what, let me, I'm, I think I'm going to handle some of the audience questions now. Then I'm going to ask uh, David, uh, my fellow, to present the case he presented and then Eva to present the case. But let me, let me uh, field some of the questions while they're fresh after the lectures. Uh, and I'll, I'll pose it to everybody, but let's start. Walter Jean is asking, hello, Walter, good to see you joining us. Uh, question to Mike Link. Uh, Mike, if especially if you are planning to leave tumor down low about that petroclavial meningioma, how about the anterior petrosectomy for making room to get at that tumor as opposed to your to the petrosal approach you used? So, so he's asking if you know well if you knew in advance you were going to leave tumor, why not do a smaller approach? I guess. Yeah, I have to admit that um, I'm not a big fan. Um, of that approach, particularly for large tumors. I just don't find I have as much uh, uh, working angles, um, but I don't doubt there are lots of people who um, could get an equivalent resection doing that, not putting the transverse sigmoid sinus at risk like we do with the posterior petrosal approach. The one thing that I didn't do in that case I showed, but I do quite often is actually open up that retrosigmoid dura. That changes your angle of view. And you can, I think, do a better job with that lower tumor, get a better look at the sixth nerve as it goes into Torello's canal. Um, but but it, for me, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm not as comfortable, let's say, with the anterior petrosal approach. Okay, Dr. Jose uh, Nalino, uh, welcome. Question, what do you think about the posterior petrosectomy in the semi-sitting position? Why don't we ask Nick Bembakidis to answer and then, uh, then any of the panelists. Petros, do you guys, uh, any sitting position, any of you, all four of you, maybe we could start that way. Yeah, I've never tried it, um, so I, I can't say. Um, any other panelists? 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. No, the ENT people have a very specific way they want to have the head when they're drilling. I found that to be um, true. Of course. So I've never tried it. No, no takers, Dr. Nellino, on an I2 I don't use. I hate the sitting position, and there is really, uh, we can get into that conversation perhaps later. But uh, yeah, you certainly don't want to be fighting the temporal lobe against gravity. Uh, in a semi-sitting position for a posterior petrosectomy. Jacques, I would also make the comment, um, you know, doing a posterior petrosectomy, you're working around very important venous structures. And, uh, you know, we, we occasionally get into a small hole in the sigma in which we can put a gel foam over in the lateral position. But in the sitting, it can be potentially disastrous if once you suck air into a small hole into the sigmoid. So. I think that can be a considerable risk of venous air embolism. Okay, question from Dr. Jed Quartler to, to Mike Link. Uh, that was a great talk. How do you manage your residual tumor? What is your re-op incidence? So it's, uh, I would say a bit nuanced. So in this particular patient I showed, she's only 40 years old. It was a grade one meningioma. So uh, typically I would treat that residual tumor with gamma knife radio surgery somewhere three to six months after the operation, once I'm convinced she's had a good recovery and is sort of back on track. Um, for some older patients, we sometimes just watch the residual. My goal, frankly, is to never operate on these tumors a second time. So I think they need careful follow-up. So I would say my reoperation rate is very low, mostly due to my strong bias to treat them aggressively with radio surgery up front, um, so we don't have to reoperate. Okay, uh, Dr. Gustavo Isolan, how do you perform the closure of the eustachian tube in petrosal approaches? Is it always necessary? Uh, Nick, let's let's ask Nick that one. Nick, do you, what do you guys do for your station tube? And does your answer we, we, depend on which variant of the petrosal approach? No, we, I mean, we try and close it just because you want to avoid that complication. And so, um, you know, it's rare when we don't make an attempt to try and take care of it at the time of the initial operation. Do you do the same, Mike? Because I, I don't. If I'm doing a retro lab, I want to save hearing. I, I just put fascia on the antrum of, uh, and, and I don't pack the eustachian tube. Right. I, I'm the same way. Um, so you got to preserve middle ear function. Just like uh, Jim, we like fascia lata. I take it for most of these cases. I get my fat graft and my fascia lata from the thigh. And I'll put a piece, a postage size stamp over that opening into the antrum, bone wax around it, and then pack fat against that. When the otologists aren't looking, I do put a tiny piece of fat in the middle ear to kind of add a little uh, uh, insurance that they're not going to leak. And, and I, that gives them a little bit of a conductive hearing loss for a little while, but that dissolves and, and it isn't a long-term problem. If we're doing a trans lab, then we pack the bejesus out of the eustachian tube to try and prevent uh, spinal fluid leak. Okay, Dr. Nuru Din Adeniran Bankoli, welcome. Is tamponad, uh, I guess the question, is tamponad the only way to control bleeding? And I don't know to which speaker that was um, addressed, but maybe we can, uh, handle it how do you let's say middle fossa approach uh, 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 greg why don't you hand talk to us about hemostasis in the middle fossa when do you tamponade when do you bipolar what do you do you're muted greg usually that's when you're the wisest when you're muted but i guess you'll have to <laughs> true enough well i think uh, Jacques, it's it's pretty rare that you actually need the bipolar um, in the middle fossa approach, other than maybe when you're extra dural still, and and sometimes obviously with middle meningeal artery um, taking it and its branches, uh, but most of the time, and uh, you know, Dr. Altschiller will will know this is true. We work really hard just to tamponade. I think the enemy of um, 
cranial nerve function is often the bipolar. And uh, if, if there's venous bleeding, it should really just be tamponade. Um, using a bipolar, I think, is excessive and something that can be dangerous. So uh, the only time I really am, feel forced to use um, uh, a bipolar is when there's arterial bleeding. And, and if it's a small arterial intradural, then you can even get that most of the time to stop with a uh, very uh, small, if you remember the Samson and Bacher aneurysm book, they have a very, very nice uh, illustration. The, put a little bit of thrombosilk gel foam in a micro patty over it, hold pressure, and usually in about 30 seconds, uh, that's all you need, just a little patience. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, sorry. There's an audio feedback. Let's see. Oh, Marcelo Platas, my good friend, welcome. Um, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's always with us. Marcelo has a question. Actually, it applies to everybody. For your suboccipital approach, tell us your position. A lateral, supine, semi-sitting. Jim, how do you do your, uh, uh, let's say, retrosigmoid approach? Uh, do you vary your position based on the pathology, or is it always one position? Yeah, I, for retrosigmoid, I, I always do lateral. It's what I'm comfortable with. I, I find that lateral, the shoulder is less in my way than a supine head turn. Um, that's just been my preference that works. Okay. Nick? the same I, I agree unless you have a big patient then they have big shoulders you know i think you get in the lateral position with uh, you know some some little maneuvering try and get the shoulder down out of the way especially if you know if you're working on the right side and your right-handed surgeon it can really be a problem so um how about you mike yeah i do them all lateral and and greg You're muted. He doesn't do them. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that again. So uh, I didn't say earlier because it's such an exceptional uh, case, but I do 99% of uh, retrosigmoids lateral uh, park bench position. Um, for patients who have a very high BMI, um, a very large tumor, uh, I think there is a I, although I don't enjoy it, there is a, um, a good reason to sometimes consider the sitting position. It's very difficult, as others have pointed out. I've had one patient early on who had an um, uh, air embolus. I did go with my anesthesiology team to Germany to see Dr. Tata, Tata Giba uh, and, his, and his course. And it was, I thought, it was amazing because they don't actually avoid it, but they know how to manage air. Uh, it was kind of scary to, to watch, uh, but you know, for some centers who do it a lot, I think it's it's useful, and particularly for a patient who's has a very high BMI. Those patients that are difficult, it can be a useful but infrequently yeah. yeah. used uh, tool. Yeah, but I tell you though, there is semi sitting, and there is sitting, and there is lounging position, and as you know. Tata, Marcos Tatajiba, a good friend of mine, his position is lounging, meaning the feet are at the level, if not higher than the head. That's True not enough. the tradition. Yeah, it's thing. not actual sitting. Yeah. It's a, it's it's a lounging sitting. or semi-sitting. Right. right. Uh, Dr. Shervin Taslimi, why do you... Ah, you know, I actually... Jim, this is for you, and I actually completely agree with Dr. Taslimi. And here is his question. It's a nomenclature question. Why do you call the external layer of the nerve perineurum as opposed to epineurum? And I think he's right, but maybe we should go back to the paper you've uh, quoted of 2009. Uh, you're muted, Jim. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, I think it's probably a nomenclature issue like you pointed out. I mean, I would have to go back to the histology the original yeah. paper, but I'm just adopting the right. nomenclature that has been used uh, by Sasaki as well as others in, in their variety of lectures and papers. Yeah, no, because I mean, Dr. Taslimi is right. You know, the perineurum is what's around the individual, the fascicles and the epineurum, at least that's the way it, we st I studied in medical school, is around the entire nerve. So it would make more sense to use a, 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 sub epineurial layer but we should go back to the drawing board and see what what we see thanks for your very good question dr teslimi um 
Dr. Tarek Rayan, if the tumor is on the left side, would that change your selection of approach to avoid left temporal lobe complications to Dr. Link? Or I guess Nick Bambakidis as well. Left versus yeah, right, do you guys choose yeah. a different approach? Yeah, it's a consideration, especially in older people who have, you know, thin, thinner dura. And um, so I'm, I'm a little less apt, frankly, to, to, to tackle left-sided lesion that way. I know what Mike thinks, but it makes me a little nervous. We certainly think about it. And um, the counter to that is that usually the left transverse sigmoid sinus is the non-dominant side. So it makes you a little more inclined to want to do it on the left, but it's the dominant hemisphere. I have to admit, I don't get an MRV on every uh, posterior petrosectomy case that I do, but I do look at the T2 and see if I can tell if there's a really large vein of LeBay on the left and, and if it looks like it's coming in to the tent, um, that will really uh, sway me to not do a, a pre-sigmoid approach, but rather just try and do it all retro-sigmoid or retro-sigmoid combined with middle foss. Okay, Dr. Magdil Kalini, again to you, Jim. How do you find the, let's call it for now, the perineural plane in <laughs> NF2? Same technique. Um, you know, same same method. You know, I look for like I guess I can answer Anas's question because I think it's similar. You know, the the peri, peri, the vestibular nerve is when you look at it on these large tumors. There's going to be parts of it where you could see the striations of the nerve fibers on the surface of the tumor, and I think you have to avoid the temptation of wanting to bipolar the tumor capsule because that will destroy your ability to visualize the difference. And then as you go out into the periphery, that's when I start to divide, make that plane. And there'll be portions of it that look like nerve fibers. And then there'll be portions of it that gets very thin and it looks like a clear membrane. And once you find that, then you can distinguish true tumor capsule from the, the fibers or the, the perineurium. The one thing I would say in NF2 is sometimes you can get tumors on both sides of the nerve because you can have uh, multi-clonal uh, tumors in the NF2, so you have to be careful of that. Yeah, and I, I concur with you as I tell my fellows and residents, I mean, even if there is no hearing to save, you, you try to save these as buffers, as much, use them as buffer as much as you can. Doesn't matter how large the tumor is, there always is a layer, no matter how thin it is. I, uh, I concur with you that that's definitely the best way to do it. And that actually answers the next uh, uh, Dr. Anas Abushesh similar question about how to find it. So, uh, and the last question, uh, what's that? Ah, uh, Dr. Muhammad Asfour, if the intraoperative neural monitoring readings doesn't go with my visuals, what do you choose to trust? So I guess his question is, um, you know, do you get, well, let me, let me generalize this question. How often do you get false positive? Let's say when you're trying to stimulate a nerve fascicle and it turns out to be facial, or it appears to be facial nerve. And you know, for sure, that's not the facial nerve. And perhaps the same question regarding uh, uh, dampening of the hearing waves. What do you guys think? And any, any taker in acoustic neuromas? Let me start with Greg. Greg, I mean, we all know there are cross connections between eighth nerve and seventh nerve. So when you stimulate directly, how, how do you avoid false positive uh, stimulation? You're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> you think I learned. The, 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 uh, it's a great question. The the nervous intermedius is the most common one, you know, situation where you're stimulating away from seven and then, you know, you get a pretty good stim onto seven. Um, and so otherwise I, I think it's pretty uncommon actually, unless you have the stimulation uh, set up high, but I, I usually start with a low stim and see if I can find it, you know, work distal to proximal or vice versa if you've had very clean. And then on the, with, with regard to the BSER, 
Um, I think it's much more common to have uh, false negative. You know, that there have been many, many times when if I just wait a few minutes after dissecting, I think that doesn't make sense to me that the BSCR has been, you know, diminished or lost. And if I wait, it just comes back. I, I can't tell you how many times that's happened. Okay. Um, all right. Dave, why don't I invite David Altschuler to share his screen and show you guys a case for your input. And, uh, you know, during the surgery, I'll just to I'll take the opportunity to ask you some questions during portions of the video that he will show. David, all yours. Okay, Again, it's been wonderful. See we see your screen. Uh, just wanted to introduce you. It's been wonderful to have you as our current fellow. Uh, thanks to Greg Thompson's uh, mentoring at University of Michigan. You've been terrific. So go ahead, David. Yes, yeah, it's an honor for me to be able to speak as always at the symposium. And this month particularly special for me to have Dr. Thompson here and and I've just been so fortunate to uh, to learn from such legendary surgeons and mentors and, and great people and both Dr. Thompson and Dr. Morka. So thank you both uh, very, very much. And I'll uh, present a case that we did a couple of months ago, 66 year old woman and they came in with headaches, gait imbalance, dysphonia, dysphagia. Um, so, sorry, David, a, David, sorry uh, to interrupt you. David, the left side of meningioma that had grown and was treated with, um, with radiation, actually. Um, her exam, she had hyperesthesia on the, the tumor side and uh, otherwise a normal exam other than some gait imbalance. And here's her preoperative imaging. And I'll show some short video clips here. So before jumping to um, a straightaway answer anatomic location of where this is, um, something that we touched on a little bit before uh, for the panelists, how would you classify or name this tumor? Yeah, Mike, you, you kind of avoided that topic earlier, but what, tell us how you, I mean, you know, you classify in your own series the various meningiomas of the posterior and or middle fossa. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know how we're ever gonna sort of solve this dilemma, I have to admit. Um, anything that is um, posterior to the internal auditory canal, I just call it a cerebellopontine angle uh, meningioma. Um, I kind of look, um, at where the center of the tumor is. So I think there's jugular tubercle meningiomas, which are a bit lower. There's certainly frame and magnum meningiomas. We all know what that looks like. And then it gets more complicated as you get superior and anterior to the internal auditory canal. And the ones where I'm pretty darn sure the trigeminal nerve is pushed medial, I call those usually petrotentorial meningiomas, classically Almefti um, and Shaker, have always said, if you're going to call it a petroclival meningioma, it has to push the trigeminal nerve laterally. But I find somewhere it pushes the trigeminal nerve inferiorly. Um, but I would call this uh, a petroclival meningioma, the one that you're showing. And then there are true clival meningiomas, and Nick showed one of those, and those are just the worst of the worst, of course. Um, but I, I, would, I would call this a petroclival meningioma for whatever it's worth. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you said, Mike. I, so I don't think there is much of a controversy. I usually call them premiatal, postmeatal, and the premiatal ones, it all has to do with the trigeminal nerve. Any of the other panelists disagree with the issue of the trigeminal nerve deviation and, you know, calling it petroclival when it's medial to it? I mean, to me, that's a definition of it. But... No? Okay, no, David. I agree. Okay, go ahead, David. All right, so I'll, I'll talk about some of the microsurgical approaches, retrosigmoid, anterior petrosal, posterior petrosal, uh, transcavernous parlateral, um, a staged operation, or uh, I think Dr. Dr. Morcos's joke here of the century so far refer to me at, the, at Miami so I can teach him how to do this approach. Um, but uh, again, to the panelists, any, any, um, thoughts on approach to this tumor? 
Nick, why don't you tell us how how you'd handle this tumor? I don't know if you want the MRI again. Yeah, so it had been radiated before and it's grown nope. through radiation. Was that? Is that right, David? Patient has been radiated. I forgot. Okay. That's correct. Yes, radio surgery. I mean, it's going to be a scarred mess. I, you know, I, I, and the hearing is intact or not intact? Yes, hearing intact. Oh, I mean, it's so big. I, I would probably do a posterior petrosectomy and then talk to the patient about hearing status and, and then, consider trying to get as, as, as wide an exposure as you could. So that, that's probably what I would do. I'm left-sided and do a okay. combined approach. Mike? Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Nick said. Um, we would do this through a posterior petrosal approach, but we would tell her that um, if things are really difficult, we're going to end up taking the labyrinth um, if we think we need the room to, to, to do a substantial resection. But we would go into it with the idea we're just going to do it through a posterior petrosectomy. Yeah. Jim? Um, I, yeah, I, I agree this is petroclival. My, my preference is to do the combined petrosal where you combine a, a kawasi with a posterior petrosectomy and then be prepared to do a uh, PLPA or a transcrucial if needed. I think taking off that superior and posterior canal really gives you that additional useful few millimeters um, and uh, you know prepare the patient for that. Jim, do you have an idea what your hearing preservation is when you do that? Um, I, I don't do that a lot, but um, I, I would say the last uh, the last three that I've done, I, I've been able to save hearing, even though um, it was diminished on the audiogram, uh, but she still maintained useful hearing. Uh, Mike, uh, there is an old paper by uh, Johnny Delachau where the hearing preservation was 80%. I've used the PLPA a number of times. We looked at our data, it was 50%. What I cannot tell you is at what point in the surgery we lost the hearing. And I should, I don't have that data to, to see if I can blame the drilling for it or the subsequent tumor dissection. So, so certainly is savable if you're working with a good neuroautologist who limits the loss of endolymph when you enter, you know, when you enter it, which by the way, it reminded me, uh, you know, I, I try to do the same thing you do, Mike, of cutting the dura behind the endolymphatic sac, but I've cut it many times through the endolymphatic sac and you don't really lose hearing. So and, uh, my autologist, uh, neurotologist also, I mean, don't seem to, <laughs> to, to have an opinion as to whether you should save or not save the endolymphatic sac. It doesn't seem to, at least in our series, to make a difference on hearing. Uh, oh, uh, Greg, sorry. What, what, uh, so what's your, how would you handle this case? So uh, this is a tough one because um, if I knew on the, the, the consistency of this, if it's soft or if it's uh, more fibrous and vascular, and they're usually more fibrous and vascular, I might approach it a little differently. I think I do, a, you know, all, all bets um, more likely to be vascular and fibrous. I'd probably do a um, a posterior petrosal approach, but sometimes you can get lucky and do a combined middle fossa with a retrolab approach if the hearing is good. Uh, the problem with the retrolab is, of course, it's not much exposure, but when you combine it and, um, uh, you know, divide the tentorium, and it's a little harder because here it's on the left side too, but uh, it can give you a better exposure with the help of your otologist than you think you're going to get. And so if it was a soft tumor, that's, I'd, I'd at least consider, you know, consider whether that's the case. How do you know if it's gonna be a soft tumor? Well, if I think it's a very old tumor for one, I, I would do it. If it's in a young patient, for some reason, the faster growing tumors seem to be softer, I think, has been my observation. I'm curious to see if others have had the same feeling that, you know, large tumors in a young patient tend to be not as fibrous. 
I know we'd all be a lot better surgeons if we knew ahead of time what the tumor consistency was, that's for sure. Fred told me, you have to tell me if this is true, Mike Link. Um, uh, he, he, the, um, I'm told that at the Mayo Clinic, they're doing some imaging studies to try and assess how soft the tumors are. Yeah, so MR elastography, yeah, where the patient's uh, head is put on a special pillow and it actually shakes the head at a high frequency and the brain is sloshing around and the tumor sloshing around. And uh, they can actually come up with a measurement both to show is the tumor soft or firm and is the tumor gonna be sticky? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the, the result, the preliminary uh, results are pretty darn interesting. I think it's still got a ways to go, but uh, we're hoping that that is going to be um, a standard part of the uh, evaluation of tumor studies. Very interesting. Thanks. Okay. Well, and bef before, I guess, go ahead, David, before we tell you what we did here, if we left a residual tumor, Tell us your thoughts on your options. Observe radiosurgery immediately or radiosurgery conditional on regrowth. Um, Greg, what, how do you handle residual? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it depends on, uh, number one, we're lucky enough to save hearing. If you save hearing, radiosurgery is a good short-term but not a good long-term hearing preservation approach. Um, and so... Uh, that would have an impact. I think if you didn't save hearing uh, and there was a substantial amount of tumor and, and then on say six months follow-up, there was evidence of growth, then I'd, I'd treat with radiosurgery. And other, other speakers, any dif differing opinions? How to handle a post-op residual meninge, petroclival meninge? The, the patient was already irradiated, is that right, in this case? Yes. No, I'm asking, yeah, we're asking in general. Oh, in general. Question. Yes, right. When you leave a residual petroclival, how would you? Yeah, it, it? if it's a large tumor, I, I you know, I, it's, I, I follow the paper, uh, the data that uh, Teet Matheson had presented some years ago right. about uh, radiating up front versus waiting till the residual grows. Their results showed that radiating up front was better tumor control. Yeah, I I I see. I know his data, but <laughs> I still don't don't apply it. I still sit tight and and save the bullet till later. But I'm not sure what what the real right answer is. That's why. Yeah, we we would probably sit tight too. And I, I you know I for the same same reason, but. I'm a little bit optimistic that um, as we look at more uh, chromosomal and other genomic analysis of these tumors, not just the WHO grade, which is almost useless, I found, um, unless it's a grade three meningioma, then we know it's gonna act bad. Um, I hope we can get a better idea of which tumors are gonna be more aggressive after subtotal resection and that can help guide us, but I don't think we're there yet. But for any residents, fellows listening, that's a that's a good goal for your career. I'm probably too old to figure it out. <laughs> You're right. It's a hot topic and very important topic. We're gonna, our trainees are going to look back at how we classified things and laugh at us how archaic we were. But so so we did about our own teachers. So you know that that's uh, inevitable. David, t t tell 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 them what what was done. Uh, so we did a, a quasi an anterior petrosectomy um, due to the, the majority of the tumor being above the internal auditory canal and uh, tumor in the middle fossa and, and posterior fossa. And she's in good health otherwise. Uh, so here's our, our positioning. Supine with a large shoulder bump and a fairly aggressive head turn, uh, though care not to, not to obstruct uh, venous outflow on the contralateral side. And here's some key steps to our operation that uh, the panelists have covered. And I'll uh, freeze through this, this video. Um, By the way, lumbar drain is essential. And I was, uh, while you're doing, actually, go, while you're showing this, no, no, keep showing it. Don't stop it so I don't waste time. Uh, I, do I assume all of you use lumbar drain for combined petrosal approaches? Yes. Uh, I don't anymore, actually. 
really i i boy it makes a huge difference i find i mean the temporal lobe is so relaxed you don't use self-retaining retractor pretty much except few moments i i'm a firm believer in the lumbar drain it just relaxes everything why do you stop mike just did didn't help Honestly, you. Um, you know, I always get into the posterior fossa and get CSF off right away and that relaxes things. And I've had a few patients who get, you know, a chronic uh, low pressure headache and need an epidural blood patch. And it's always on Saturday and you can't get it done till Monday. So anyway, I've become, I used to use lumbar drains and everything, but I've gotten, I think, away from it a little bit. Go ahead, um, David. I'm sorry. Just, I, oh, go ahead, Greg. Sorry. Oh, go I was ahead. just going to say, I'm with Mike on this. I, I almost never use lumbar drains anymore. I used to use them a lot um, and because they make it a quicker start. But I find that I can get it, the CSF out of the posterior fossa and sometimes even just middle fossa. But the, the, the real issue is that I've, we've had a couple. What I've had and one of my partners had a bad complication with lumbar drain um, on first night post-op. David, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you from commenting. Go ahead. Just, just letting the, the video play here, but uh, um, showing the, the initial drilling and, um, and opening the dura here, um, the chevron shaped um, connection of the, the three dural leaflets, the middle fossil dura, pre sigmoid dura, and then the tentorium meeting at the superior petrosal sinus. And, division of the petrosal sinus. Uh, this is just opening the, the uh, pre-sigmoid dura, trigeminal nerve, and first glimpses of tumor here. So let's speed up a little bit. Uh, section hey, of David, did you cut the tentorium? Sorry, Dr. Lynch? Uh, did, did you cut the tentorium or? Yeah, I guess yes, that's what you're happening. doing now. It, it's happening right now, yes. Yeah, got it. Yes, Oh yeah, that's the whole key, of course, to the approach. Yeah, as you mentioned, Mike. You can see the fourth nerve. And then the initial tumor resection. Ultrasonic aspirator and a glimpse of the basilar artery. And the final piece of tumor being removed. And then closure with um, duragen repair of the petrus defect and then the convexity of dura as well. And then uh, here's our post op imaging. And the patient did really well. She had a, a fourth nerve palsy immediately after surgery and then a, a sixth nerve palsy that got better by the time she was seen in clinic as well. You know, uh, I, I obviously never use Kawase below internal auditory canal. Uh, and this is really just borderline. And uh, But below IAC, it's just gets harder and harder, and then I would use a pet posterior petrosal approach. But this one, you could get the feeling that, you know, I would get away with the Kawase, and, and, and we did. And, and, you know, I don't regret the choice of approach. Beautiful. That's a fantastic yeah, I'm result. Um, uh, is Eva here? Yeah, uh, I'm here, Dr. Morgan. Oh, you, you finished the OR, Eva. Welcome again. Eva, Eva prepared a nice acoustic case for us, and she'd like to share, ask you folks what you do. Okay, I just shared my screen. You can see it, Dr. Morcos? Yes, very well, Eva. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, thank you all the panelists for their excellent talks. They were all very good. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Morcos as well for giving me this opportunity to talk and also thank Nick, Dr. Nicholas Kahn, who was Dr. Morcos's former fellow and now is an attending at University of Tennessee um, for his help as well. And so uh, we picked this case because 
um, you know, there's a variety of different approaches to this tumor. And so we wanted to get the opinion of the expert panelists. So this is a 63 year old female with two months of progressive gait uh, instability and right-sided hearing loss and decreased sensation over the right side of her face. She has no other relevant past medical history and no other physical exam findings. And so this is a CUS grade four acoustic neuroma. Um, and then this is the coronal. And so just now we'll turn it over to the panel of experts um, and just get their opinion on how they would approach this tumor. Um, and so just quickly, a 63-year-old woman with right-sided hearing loss and uh, decreased sensation over the right side of the face. And so the management options to consider are observation, radio surgery, microsurgery and radio surgery together, or microsurgery alone. And if uh, you choose the microsurgical approach. Would you do translab or retro SIG? And what position would you position the patient for retro SIG? And uh, in regards to the degree of resection, would you do gross total regardless of operative findings or based on intraop findings or just predetermined intentional subtotal resection? Uh, Nick, what, how would you handle this case? Well, I mean, it's a big, pretty symptomatic tumor, so I would I would recommend taking it out. I I agree with Jim. I mean, I I, I never bought into the planned subtotal thing. I mean, I, I I've always, you know, go in trying to get as much of the tumor out as you safely, reasonably can. And so, I I don't know. I I did look at the the mastoid a little closer and just kind of get an idea of. Uh, how tight a window it would be. It looked like most, there wasn't that much, there's some tumor in the IAC, but um, late in or mid to late 60s, pretty relaxed brain. I, I'd probably just do a retro sig on it, to be honest with you. Um, so so, so to tell to the audience, Nick, tell the audience maybe the, the other way around, when do you ever choose a trans lab? Or do you, I mean, or do you, or what, what's what's your take on the choice between both approaches? Well, I, I it, sometimes it depends on which uh, autologist I'm working with, to be honest. Yeah. But uh, you know, if we're going to be frankly honest with each other, just amongst us, sure, uh, the f four or five of us. But I, you know, I think I think you know, obviously, he hearing is is a consideration. It's absent, and in a big tumor, that's not a consideration in any event. I think Mike talked about the the jugular bulb height and the mastoid with which you know. I think are critically important. Um, and then patient age, I think, is a consideration too. And younger folks, they have tighter brains. Uh, you know, I like trans labs. They're, it's a little bit more narrow window, but um, you're not fighting the cerebellum nearly as much. Um, so those are all the things that kind of go into it. Um, okay. That, and and my... in older people, I, I like to shorten the duration of the case in any in any event too, right? So let's just be honest, typically your retrosig resection is two, three hours less surg surgical time for an older patient, especially if they're a big patient. You know, I think you can you can minimize some of those complications too. So those all go into it. So that being said, I think again for here, probably a retrosig is very reasonable. Uh, Mike, you've given a lot of thought to acoustic neuromas and you've published extensively. Uh, let me ask you this. Is there an upper limit on the size of a tumor that can be handled trans lab in experienced hands? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, so people who do a lot of trans lab, I think, can do giant tumors really well trans lab. Um, much like Nick, our bias is for large tumors to do them retro sigmoid. Um, so uh, in, in this, I think... Um, I think this is a great tumor for either a retro sigmoid or a trans lab. Even if the patient had perfect hearing, I think the chance of preserving hearing is very, very low. Um, the, if you look at the axis of the tumor, you know, it tends to uh, grow more towards the brain stem than along the face of the petrous bone. And I think there's a maybe a tiny advantage to a trans labyrinthine trajectory for that. But I think you could do a great job with this tumor, either retro sigmoid or trans lab. And just as Nick alluded to, sometimes we look at the OR calendar and say, hey, my room's open next week. Let's do a retro sigmoid. And we look at Colin Driscoll or Matt Carlson's OR and they say, oh, we have an opening next week. Then we're going to do a trans lab. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see that those same factors actually apply in all the centers.
without getting into <laughs> too much details. But but for the audience to know that obviously there is more than pure anatomy and and, and pure tumor factors that get into deciding what an approach. But there's no question the trans lab at our place, and I work with outstanding neuroautologists, it's an extra three hours for sure um, than compared to a retrosig. Jim, uh, retrosig, trans lab, does it either way or? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Mike. It, it, we can go either way. Um, and like he said, I, I always, I look at the long axis of the tumor as well. So where I find trans lab most advantageous is if the long axis of the tumor looks more horizontal, like digging into the brainstem. And I think that's where retrosigmoid becomes more difficult and you can get into some retraction issues, which I've had a few complications of. So in those cases, I would come trans lab. But I think for this one particularly, I would do retrosig. There's a nice CSF cleft, al cleft along the Petrus Ridge, gives you some room and she's an older patient. and. For the reasons mentioned above, shorter operative time, I would favor retrosigmoid, lateral position. You, you know, having said that, actually, what we, sh we should have shown you a case we did, David and I, on Monday, which very rarely I do that, is both translab and retrosig on a huge tumor. I was doing mostly translab, then a little corner of it was hard to see, so I opened the dura behind the sigmoid. And, and you know, we'll put that video together for another time. But that was, again, don't rule that out. Why not combine the advantages of both occasionally in, in some massive tumors? Uh, we just did that on Monday. Um, okay, Eva, go ahead. So then our second question is uh, how you would, if, if there is residual left, how would you manage residual tumor? Would you observe it? Would you do radiosurgery immediately or only if the tumor grows or would you reoperate if the tumor grows? Greg, how do you handle residual acoustics? Do you watch? You're muted. You're muted. Yes, thanks. Um, I, I like I, I told you before, uh, Jacques, on a meningioma patient, similar for me, unless there's substantial regrowth. I think a lot of times, particularly for a tumor in an elderly patient like this, if you have a small residual, and I think, you know, Jim Liu is right. I, I do exactly the same thing. I always go in thinking, well, I'll get out as much as I can um, remove safely without putting the facial nerve at risk. Uh, and, and if there's a, a substantial or even a you know, just a small piece, um, I would probably watch it and, and uh, see how things go. And if it, if it grows, then yeah, I'd treat it with radio surgery soon thereafter. I think on this one, by the way, I would have probably chosen, you could do it either way, retrosurgery or trans lab, but I probably, I'm, I'm probably spoiled by my otologist. I would have gone uh, trans lab on this. There's a little nose that goes anterior that might be a little bit difficult, but I think the, even though the, the case is a little bit longer. I find that, um, I think Mike may have said this earlier, the patients wake up with something more like an ear uh, operation and that there's not much uh, retraction on that. And she had um, not only hearing loss, but a pretty wide uh, petrosal, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know about the, the jugular bulb, but the, the it looked like it was not a small approach um, from a bony standpoint. Okay, Eva, why don't you show them what we did? And while you're showing the video, I will uh, ask a couple more questions. So we, uh, you know, we th thought about everything that the panelists brought up and they're all excellent points. And we actually ended up deciding to do a retrosigmoid craniotomy and we positioned the patient lateral and flexed the head with up some upward translation and tilted the vertex down. And so we do a C-shape retroauricular incision and then T the muscle flap. And so then we actually do a three by three craniotomy instead of a craniectomy here. And so here's the video. We get CSF from foramen magnum and then work our way up um, from dissecting the adhesions off the lower cranial nerves all the way up to the tentorium. Um, and then- oh, uh, 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 Eva, sorry, can you pause it one second? Again, for the audience, and I'm sure the panelists will all agree, this is such an important step. I mean, it's basic, but to stimulate the dorsal surface of the tumor, I have at least five cases of essentially facial neuromas where that whole surface stimulates. And so for the younger 
people in the audience, please stimulate the tumor before you start debulking it. It may not be obvious, but the facial nerve could be all over this surface and you will not realize it till you stimulate. Go ahead, Eva. So yeah, and so after we stimulate, there's no uh, facial nerve stimulation. So now we begin to debulk the tumor. And so just because I know we're running a little bit short on time, I'll fast yeah. forward a little bit. So um, here we identify a facial nerve exit zone at the brainstem. And then here we start uh, beginning to drill the IAC. And so here's some more drilling. And then here we're taking out the intracanalicular portion of the tumor. And then here, uh, right here we were developing the plane between the uh, brainstem and the tumor. Otherwise known as the subepineural plane. <laughs> <laughs> and so just kind of fast forwarding to the end, um, this is the rest of the tumor resection. We actually ended up uh, getting about 97% resection because at the end, uh, there was a little portion on the facial nerve that was stuck um, and very adherent. And so we decided not to chase after that. And so uh, at the end of the case, the facial nerve stimulated at 0 0.05 milliamps at the brainstem. And um, here is the postoperative imaging. And so there's a little bit of a component in the IAC is right here. And then here, you can see on the coronal, there's a little in the IAC as well. And the patient did well postoperatively. She had initially a house Brachman II um, postoperatively, but that resolved on subsequent follow-up visits. Um, and then for the residual, we've, we've just been watching it. It hasn't grown yet. That's it. Thank you, Eva, for putting the video together. Uh, let, me, let me field a couple more questions to finish the session from the audience. Um, the, uh, what what do you guys do for a higher grade house Brackman score post-op? Do you refer for early facial muscle reanimation exercises or wait for functional recovery? Mike, could you tackle this question? Yeah, I think it's Oh, by the way, this is Dr. Cedric Shorter. Good to see you, Cedric. Go ahead. Oh, hey, Cedric. Yeah, uh, down in Tampa. Um, um, I think it's a great question. Uh, so... Certainly, if I know the nerve is intact, um, you know, we just basically take care of the eye. So um, we kind of figure out in the first two weeks what their eye is going to do. Some young people maintain pretty good tone, just need some eye lubrication drops, maybe an eye bubble at night to hold the moisture in. Uh, other people, we do an early uh, temporary, <coughs> excuse me, temporary tarsorophy. Uh, or even an early gold or platinum weight. Um, and, th and then basically we wait. Obviously, if we know the nerve is blitz, then we do early reanimation. Um, any, I, I don't want to keep you much longer. This We've been at it now two hours, 23 minutes. When you're having fun, it's really easy. Any last minute comments from any panelist to any other or... Anything you'd like to say? I, I would just make I have a question. Oh, I, I was just going to, I just had a quick question for the, for the panelists. I, um, how, how many, does everyone have a routine integral drilling of the, of the IAC for the retro SIG cases? I mean, I assume most of us have our ENT colleagues come in and do integral drilling. Um, what, what are your practice patterns in terms of, uh, retraction use or not um, with respect to that. I mean, I, I've been trained to be low to put a retractor in the cerebellum and, you know, goes back to the Spetzler days, Jacques and Greg. We've had a couple of retraction induced injuries that we've seen because the ENT folks are not comfortable typically without having some kind of barrier. So I just wanted to see what folks are doing if, if, um, if they've seen any issues or have had any discussions with respect to that particular aspect of uh, technical nuance. Well, if I could answer first, I, uh, I mean, I never want to leave a, well, I never use a self retaining retractor for an acoustic, never, ever really. Uh, well, maybe 99%, but I certainly don't want to leave a self retaining retractor while my, my neurotologist is, is uh, drilling. So I usually put two large, wide telfas on the cerebellum and they're happy with that that's 
plenty, you know, it gives them this little barrier. I, I we haven't had any problem with that. But please, anybody else? I, yeah, Jacques, I, I'm a, a, actually the opposite. I, I will set the retractor uh, only because my neurotologist is using a, a double barrel suction irrigator, which takes up you know more room than a single barrel. And I, ha I have to be, I try not to put retractive force. I'm just using it as a brain holder or sort of like a, a per, almost like a protection. So they're, they're not going to injure the cerebellum with the drill. The other thing I'm, you have to be careful of, and I had one incident is uh, these cottonoids or the telfa, you have to be careful. You have to hide them under the blade of the retractor because we had one incident where the drill, uh, Got caught the thing and uh, the 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 string acted like a whip and luckily the facial nerve was fine uh, but it, it was a scare <laughs> so you have to be careful about well you, you know the, the way around it is to use these protected drills like Viseo that you saw in the video or the other uh, Met, uh, Midas I forgot the name of it uh, blanking on it you know with the sleeve all the way to the tip then you don't have that concern but We've actually gone to using the bone cutting, the 360 bone cutting device on the sauna pet, which is extraordinarily safe because nothing's whipping around in the posterior fossa. Um, and I it's really a little like slower, that. isn't it, Mike? It's a little slower. Uh, not much, honestly. Uh, Colin Driscoll, who's uh, the senior neurotologist I work with, he is really slick at it. You can't get as good at troughs around because the right. bit is a little bit too wide and they only have one size but um yes. but i i really like that thing it's very safe for sure yeah greg Doc, we we haven't uh well i would say more than 90 percent of the retro sigmoids i drilled the ic myself and have for many years and my senior colleague really um you know that i started with did didn't didn't have an interest in doing retro sig. The younger guys sometimes do now. And it's actually been kind of interesting because it's what you said. I've had a couple instances where um, the way that I would have done it um, is not the way they would have done it. So I set it up and, and I had what uh, Jim described, a, a spinning a cottonoid one time. That was the last time I used that. And then uh, another time, um, there's been uh, a difficult, you know, complication, you know, which is very similar. I, I think if you're going to use otology to do that, what I've learned is let them set up their own system rather than the one that, that I'm used to. So it's part of it's just a um, generational thing at Pittsburgh. We, we did all our own drilling and I came out doing that. So. <clears throat> I, I still like doing my own, although it, it does give you a nice little break in the middle of the case. I did think it was interesting, Jim, that you do your drilling early on. We've always taken out the cerebellopontine angle component and then done the drilling. So by that time, usually the cerebellum is so relaxed because you've opened all the cisterns. And just like you say, I, I often will put a retractor over the cerebellum, but it's not actually doing anything. Um, but it's very European, I'll say, Jim, to uh, do the drilling first. I kind of equate that with the with the masters of Europe. I think it keeps the bone dust out of the, the CSF space, too, because you haven't opened up the arachnoid. So that's one, one other reason we do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Anything else, gentlemen or lady? Otherwise, this I've already had, as you can read, very positive reviews. Thank you very much for an outstanding session that is now immortalized by being recorded for our children to laugh at us later on when we're senile and demented. Uh, Chuck, I do have one thing since you just reminded me oh. maybe recorded. I think I should uh, correct myself. I may have misspoken. The, the superior vestibular nerve innervates a horizontal canal. I, I think I misspoke when I said that. I just want to make sure that that's for posterity correct. So. You stand corrected, self-corrected. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I bid you all good night, good morning, whatever time zones you're in. Thank you very much, guys. And, and, and Eva, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks good very night. much.